All right, and we are live. Hey, welcome to Talking Doctrine, and thank you for joining us this evening. Tonight is Monday's Milk, it's number 42, and we are fishing in the chat room. Now, uh, Jason's usually here. He usually starts the broadcast off, actually. Um, I didn't even think. I should have told uh, Daryl to start it off, since I'm kind of the guest tonight. But Jason's at home with uh, with his... With, he has some guests, and so he's not going to be able to join us this evening. He might pop up in the chat room, but uh, he's unable to join. And... Uh, I just uh, invited um, Jen, if you guys know her, she might pop on. You guys know Daryl. Daryl's with me. Say hi, Daryl. Greetings. Hello. Greetings. Everybody in the chat, I see there's quite a few people talking already. That's great. Right. Already got a fellowship going on. And then uh, also, uh, tonight... Uh, possibly, maybe, uh, Paula might jump in if she's able to and if uh, she has something to say. But we're actually looking for people to join us from the chat room. So if anybody would like to join on the panel tonight, we're, you're welcome. It's uh, kind of an open panel to where we're fishing for people to join us and we're also fishing for topics in the chat room so if you guys uh if any of you guys um want to join us please uh oh i don't that's i didn't fix the uh whatever you call it the icon for that i guess i'll have to do that in a minute <laughs> but I do want to say hey to everybody who's here so far. And Lil, I see you there, highlighted. Uh, good to see you. Mike, it's good to see you. And Estevan, uh, Joseph popped in here. Frank B. Frank B. loves Jesus, everybody. In case you didn't know that, I want you to know that he says it live. <laughs> uh, and, uh, okay, Luke, um, I will send you the link. And Sarah, good to see you, sister going fishing um right and i love the saying for the fishing you know you don't clean them before you catch them so uh, it's a good uh metaphor when it comes to you got to get them in the boat first <laughs> right exactly and then they actually it's it, they get cleaned from the inside so it's a little bit different uh, true uh, it's a little bit different um, so let me see, let me get the link ready so I can send it to Luke. And Mike, I know you're shy, but, uh, you don't, none of us have the cameras on on Monday nights. Well, Luke may, he, uh, whoops. Uh, he, yeah, he always puts on, his camera on. He's been on three guns already, and, uh, I don't see why he can't do it again. Come on, Mike, jump in. Right. Right, if you, if you feel, um... Uh, the urge, the leaning, the being pushed, then go ahead, swallow, swallow your pride, jump on in. Uh, let's see, what am I doing here? I don't really need a subject. So, Luke, it is in your. I remember being a fighting fish. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. All right, so do you guys have any topics that you want to talk about? I saw one liberally conservative. It's good to see you. Welcome. I didn't say hi to you. And I saw a topic from you. Um, what was that? Yeah, that was, that was uh, early on in the chat room, uh, dealing with self-control. Self-control. That's a good one. Um, well. It was either self-control or mental anguish. That was another person brought that up, and uh, I haven't seen any others yet. Um, right, mental anguish. See, that came from Mike. So, Mike, come on here, and that one's too broad to talk about. We need to be a little bit more specific. And look at that. Sarah says that uh, she'll come on if you'll come on. And this would be the first time Sarah has been on air. 
So it it would where you've done it before, Mike. <laughs> it would be Sarah's first time. So come on, if you're if you're willing, that would be awesome. But don't feel pressured. Here you um, go. All your all your friends are here, Mike. I'm here. Yeah, Sarah can be here. Matthias, that'd be great. Right, Luke's on his way up. So, with uh, with what Liberty LC? Let's just call this person LC. LC, right? Uh, with what LC was saying, self control is is big, but it, I did an exhortation on the uh, Church of Eternally Secure not too long ago about the difference between responding and reacting. If the self-control is a lot of times when you have a problem with it, it's because you're reacting in the flesh. And it's uh, impulsive. And without contemplation or... Uh, I'm trying to think of a word that rhymes with that, but I can't praying about it, actually taking it to God. So even if it's within a couple seconds, you can still take something to God beforehand and respond in the spirit rather than reacting in the flesh. So self-control really is not about self-control as it is as much as um, self-release. Is that a good way to put it? Uh, to die to yourself? To stay, to not walk after the flesh, but, you know, to become, you must decrease and he must increase in your life and you're walking in the spirit. So it's not about self-control, it's about giving yourself to Him. And if you are giving yourself to Him more out of each day than you're not, as in if you're walking after the Spirit more than you're walking after the flesh, if you're walking after the Spirit, then by default you will respond and in turn the world will call it self-control. So if you're, you don't try to worry about the action at the moment that it happens, at the circumstance, the happenstance, try to pray without ceasing. Think on these things, the good things, and talking to God and trying to stay in the Spirit. So the same way you work on spirit control, is a better way to put it for us saints, um, the, the, the same way that we work on that is the same way we keep ourselves from sin. We don't try to stay away from sin. We try to walk after the Spirit. And when we walk after the Spirit, by default, we are not sinning. And so, same thing with self-control or that would be reacting or spirit control and that would be responding so my answer to that would just be work on and it's easier said than done work on denying yourself more and more each day I'm talking about a percentage wise you know you're going to walk in the flesh some but as we work out our salvation with fear and trembling which is the salvation of the spirit, salvation of life, which is from the power of sin in our life. Um, as we work that out, uh, that spirit control will become uh, uh, second nature. So, yeah, um, well, there's a couple couple different things to think about uh, when you're talking self control. Are we talking? In, in regards to temptation, self-control from temptation or self-control during confrontation? 
two two totally different two kind of totally things. different things. But I would still say you would react or respond at either one of them with temptation. You can react in the flesh and and give in to the temptation, or you can respond in the spirit and draw closer to God. You know, in the same way that reacting if somebody's if you're if somebody is under your skin, you know, and you're either reacting or responding. I think that while they are two totally different things, I still think that walking in the spirit is the answer for both. Right. Well, see, I guess it comes with <clears throat> comes with time, uh, you know, if, for example, in traffic in uh, if you're going to get heated in traffic right you're that type of confrontation you know you're gonna jump you're gonna jump right on it you might regret it but you're gonna jump right on it right um and as far as temptation so you, you don't you don't really have the time to, to to think about it whereas the temptation you do have the time to think about it i guess uh so as far as the temptation part of it goes uh, i say focus on just keep focusing on christ you know just you stay in the word and that all, all that other stuff just fades away that's what i found in my experience uh all the temptations that i had i really don't have anymore the more i focused on him it, it stuff just faded away you know what call it deliverance if you want but i don't have those feelings anymore so matthew six thirty three: seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you amen amen exactly uh, Luke has joined us, uh, but before I throw it to you, Luke, I just want to say, Mike, um, you're wondering what are you supposed to say if you join? Well, you can give us more direct insight to what you mean by mental anguish. That is such a broad, general term that uh, I can't really um, go on, on that right now. Uh, so if you come up here, we can ask you a couple questions, or you can narrow it down for us. And Lord willing, God would direct the conversation to maybe some Bible verses that actually ended mental anguish, or whatever the issue is, if you learned it from God. So it, it would be good if you could join, but again, don't feel pressured. But also, that is really cool of Sarah to say she would come on if you did. And then she's that's a that's really encouragement right there because she's like I said never come on a live broadcast before. So, Luke, how you doing, brother? Thank you for joining. And uh, do you have any response to what I was saying or what Daryl and I were just talking about? Uh, I I don't know. I we to me it's a very very simple. And uh, I think a lot of people overthink things. Uh, if, if there, I think there's a, a principle of the mind where you can only have one thought at a time. So they, they say, well, uh, think of a, a pink elephant. Don't think of a pink elephant, and then you, you're going to be thinking of it. But if you if you think about something other than a pink elephant, the pink elephant goes out of your mind because your mind is occupied with one thing. Uh, I've never really tried to test it and get like two things in my mind at the same time. But uh, the idea is, uh, if we're focused on Jesus, if we're uh, uh, in the Word, and Jesus is on our mind, uh, how can we have anguish? Uh, how can we have worry uh, how can we have any kind of uh, problems uh, if our mind's always on Jesus so it, it just seems to me a real simple solution and uh, if that's walking in the spirit um, then it then we're, we mean the same thing I guess but just um, <clears throat> if we're busy thinking about Jesus talking about Jesus and finding ways of serving Jesus and uh, and the church then uh, uh, you don't have to worry about all the other stuff. Amen. Amen. 
Um, I just realized that I only had one mute. I was trying to adjust some screens around. Uh, and I agree with you, Luke, with what you were saying. Um, I guess ta trying to define what walking after the Spirit is would be a good thing uh, in the conversation right now. Um, because uh, uh, thinking of Jesus um, would be a necessary part of it. But um, how I define walking after the Spirit is really this is uh, a big volition, volition point in the service part of a saint's life. I think that the only time you are ever going to walk after the Spirit is if you ask God to do it. Um, there's times where the Spirit will come in and uh, uh, you'll look back and, and you'll learn from it. And then there's times where you ask the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you through a certain circumstance, instance. So if you're uh, a salesperson and you're about to go into a meeting, or if you're um, going to a PTA meeting and you're asking God to give you the words to be able to share the gospel with the teacher, uh, you know, whatever the case may be, wherever you're going, to ask God to lead you, guide you, to give you the words, or even hold your tongue, possibly. But thinking of Jesus, thinking of God, asking Him to do so in His Spirit, ye have not, ye, ye have not, because you ask not. So when you are walking in the Spirit, you ask Him to do it, and He does it. And that would be, he at that point bears his love, his peace, his long-suffering, his mercy. You know, and that's when we're, uh, those get, you know, they're on, our, on us. They're his fruits bearing on us, just, just these branches. But I, I do think that um, while you can't, not sin your way into walking in the spirit like you can't reverse the order you can't okay i'm not going to sin today so i'll make sure i'm walking it no that doesn't work like that but if you're focused on jesus and asking him to guide you through each time of the day then by default you are walking in the spirit and not sinning so um let me add something to that. The um, when I'm saying focused on Jesus, um, I, I will connect that to the uh, the verse that Paul says: uh, uh, "Continue instant in prayer." Now, I'm sure everybody's heard me talk about this before, but I I, I love the way that is expressed. Um, it's it's an unusual way of writing. Continue instant in prayer. And uh, to me, the way I understand that and believe it, we should apply it is that uh, immediately when we wake up, uh, we should begin praying. And, and it's something you have to train yourself. And then when you train yourself to do it, 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 it becomes the default. Immediately, you'll learn that when you wake up, you begin praying. It doesn't mean that you have to have some eloquent, uh, long dialogue with Jesus. It just means you're making contact initially. I wake up. Initially, I'm talking to Jesus. Lord, thank you for this day. And another day, guide me today. Help me today. But simply, my, my prayer is this. I, I probably have the most simplistic kind of praying that's possible. It's mostly just help me, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, all day. And uh, by... As saying, help me, Jesus, I mean, help me live this day. And that is, I would say, that would be walking in the Spirit. So 
having your mind on Jesus, uh, uh, instantly you continue this dialogue, this conversation, this prayer with Jesus all day long, unless your mind is preoccupied. Uh, I, I said earlier that your mind can only have one thing on, on it at a time. So that means that let, let's say you're busy doing a, a, a work task or you're having a conversation with somebody. I mean, if you're having a conversation with, uh, uh, I'm talking to Daryl, uh, I'm, I'm not thinking about Jesus at that moment because I'm think I'm focused on him. Uh, but when the conversation is over with Daryl, the default should be, instantly continue my dialogue my conversation with jesus my connection to him and uh, uh and when we when we train ourselves to do that it doesn't just happen you have to train yourself and then it becomes the default and that it just happens without thinking about it once you get used to it so uh, i would say that would be how you can uh in it what was the word you used um volition the volition uh of uh, okay i'm 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 choosing to uh make sure each day each moment of the day whenever as, as much as possible i'm choosing i'm using my volition to get this um, um walking in the spirit correct right but we don't do it but we ask him to do it through us but that's exactly that's exactly it. Awesome. It's hard to explain because talking about spiritual things and trying to put them in a carnal understanding is uh, is a little difficult <laughs> at times. But um, so yeah, uh, talking about self control, that was uh, one of the topics. Mental anguish. I would love to talk about it. Okay, hang on a second here. A melted zone and uh, Esteban disagrees with you. Yay. <laughs> um, don't focus on yourself. Focus on Jesus and his righteousness. He says, I disagree because when you focus on Jesus, on Jesus Christ, uh, you are walking in the Holy Ghost. And then, yeah, then he says, don't focus on yourself. Focus on... Jesus Christ, and then down here he said, uh, "Stay focused on Jesus, not focusing on yourself." And when, when I heard Matthias say, uh, "Ask, ask to ask to walk in the Spirit," is ridiculous. That's something I used to do when I was in Lordship. Uh, okay. <clears throat> not really sure what that means. Right. Um, well, because I don't think that anything that I said uh, was focus on yourself. <laughs> So that was a little shocking. Um, I agree. You're not focusing on yourself. You're asking God to work in and through you. Um, and no, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but the Lordship people don't... They're trying to say that by not sinning, they are walking in the spirit. And I, what I said was that you can't work that in reverse. It doesn't work that way. You can't not sin your way into walking in the spirit. But when you are in the spirit, by default, you are not sinning. And so yeah. Just, yeah, as Luke, just as Luke said, it's about, it's not focusing on yourself when you're training to not think the way of the world, but to focus on God and to going from having everything what does it matter to me in your life to going what does God think in your life let so, me let me connect this can I connect this to what we were talking about uh, uh, the other day maybe it was yesterday uh, about um, oh gee now I forgot what the hell the point uh, uh, I was going to respond to uh, Esteban's point uh, he says you don't ask him if you can walk in the spirit your spirit when you believe in Jesus you're in the spirit Yeah. so I, I don't remember the, what I was going to say when I interrupted you but maybe it'll come to me as I'm talking here uh, yeah every believer uh, Esteban is, is correct and we have the Holy Spirit 
but are we walking in the spirit? Uh, no, we're not always walking in the spirit just because the spirit is in us. We're walking in the spirit when we are being led by the spirit. And, uh, and I, I think that, um, it, as I said, if we can train ourselves, uh, and, and part of it is um, surrendering over to the Holy Spirit. So you don't have to surrender bef to, in order to get saved, as many people say. Uh, you got to surrender your life to Jesus and let him be your Lord. That, that, that should happen after you're saved. We want to surrender our will over to the Holy Spirit and listen to the Holy Spirit, allow the Holy Spirit to do a work on us, transforming us. Uh, and, and But not everybody does that so well. Some people uh, tune out the Holy Spirit. That's And uh, you, they, they don't listen. They, that's why the Bible says we can grieve with the Spirit. If we tune him out long enough, when, then we're quenching the Spirit. We don't, we've got him tuned out and can't even hear the promptings any longer. But uh, other people uh, uh, embrace the Holy Spirit's guidance and uh, use, give up their will and say, Lord, take over and, and uh, can take control. And, uh, and then the Holy Spirit will do that. But uh, I don't know of anybody who probably does this perfectly. Uh, we're all unique. And how much we respond to the Holy Spirit or resist the Holy Spirit is uh, unique to each person, how, how well or how poorly we do that. But if you're going to walk in the Spirit, that's what it's involved, involved in. It's not, we, we don't naturally walk in the Holy Spirit just because we have the Holy Spirit in us. Uh, but uh, everything I just said was not what I intended to say when I interrupted you. There was something else. I'll probably think of it when you're talking again, Matthias. <laughs> I got you. No worries. No worries. Um, but uh, and I I am not sure what I said because I do know that there is a difference. Um, and uh, uh, there we this is true. If you are saved, you are always in the spirit. But you can walk after the flesh. Or you can walk after the spirit. So when, if you ever hear me say uh, how you get in the spirit, I'm, I'm I really mean to say after to be biblically phonetic, phonetically, uh, to to say it correctly how the Bible says it, um, because uh, there is a difference. So. We are always in the spirit. That is true. But you can be in the spirit and walk after the flesh. We want to deny the flesh and we want to walk after the spirit. So, um, let's see. Do I have this up? I don't. There we go. <laughs> see Romans 8. I'll read a few verses and see if this makes sense. There is therefore no condemnation to them that are in Jesus Christ who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So this means that you can get you can get spanked by your heavenly father if you're walking after the flesh. If you read that w verse in reverse. For the law of the spirit of life in Jesus Christ hath made me free from the law of sin and death. What's the law of sin and death? That we're made free from. That when you sin, the wages of sin is death. That's the law. <laughs> uh, but we are made free from that, um, from the spirit of life. For the law of the spirit of life hath made me free from the law of the sin of uh, the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh for sin condemns sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit so this is what this is exactly what I'm sitting here saying before uh, that you that you have a volition to walk after one of the two 
For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For they to be carnally minded is death, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. But the carnal mind is enmity against God, and subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then that they are in the flesh cannot please God. This goes down to the judgment seat of Christ. How, you know, we're going to be judged. You're going to be judged by your works. I mean, doesn't that sound crazy for from a grace believer? But the Bible is clear on that. Every man, the saved and the lost, will be judged by their works. Now, we are at the judgment seat of Christ. Everyone at our judgment is already saved. We're already in our glorified bodies. There's nobody who's going to hell who's going to this judgment where we get judged by our works. Um, but what are our works judged by? If you read First Corinthians 3, the wood, hay, and stubble would be the works that people do in the flesh. And the gold, the gold, silver, and precious stone would be the works that people do when they're after the Spirit. Because uh, people can do works after while they're walking after the flesh. Uh, happens all the time. They're trying to do what, what they want to do for God rather than what God wants them to do. Uh, so, they... Uh, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. So here's the difference. Ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. So we are in the spirit. So be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man not have the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. But if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, and the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from from the dead dwell in you he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you therefore brethren we are debtors not to live to the flesh to live after the flesh for they that live after the flesh ye shall die but if ye live through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body ye shall live for as many that are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Here's another full assurance verse. And if children heirs. Hold on, there's more. Um, it's the same hope. I, this is all eternal security stuff here. For we are saved by hope. Uh, patience. Likewise. Um, let's see. And he searches the hearts and knoweth the mind of the spirit because you make an intercession for our saints. Work together. Alright, here's your Romans. Here's your uh, whatever you call it. Your Calvinist pickup here all the way to Romans 9. Um, but walking after the spirit and walking in the spirit, you'll always be in the spirit if you're saved, but you can walk after the flesh and not after the spirit. And God's not going to force you to walk after the spirit. He'll, he'll let you walk in the flesh, walk after the flesh. Your whole life after you got saved, if that's what you want to do. But you'll get to that judgment where we're, where we're judged by our works. And all your, everything will be burned up. And you'll go through with only your salvation. So, um, you do want to walk in this, after you do want to walk after the Spirit. By asking God to do it, by... You can't do it. You can't bear his fruits on you. Remember, you're the branch. That's what John 15 is all about. John 15, 1 through 8. The great white throne judgment is for the lost people. Um, 
Uh, why'd you delete him? Uh, I don't know if that was an accident or not, but, uh, I'm not sure. <coughs> so, they need Jesus' righteousness on their account. The reason non-believers are judged by their works, because they think their own righteousness will make it to heaven. Um, I think that, I actually think that, uh, God is drawing all men unto himself. And that the lost people are actively working to reject his drawing. So when they go to their judgment, they're going to be judged by their works. Those who uh, got more of the truth, more of God's revealing to them. Maybe they tasted of the Holy Ghost more and they still rejected um, they're going to be judged by their works and there's going to be some sort of greater punishment, uh, maybe more anguish. I don't know what the case may be, uh, but, and then some people, uh, who didn't, maybe they didn't, uh, deny Jesus that much. Maybe they just didn't, uh, uh, you know, or they denied him enough to go to hell, but not as much as the person who was like actively trying to fight against him in, in a satanic cult or something. They'll be judged by their works and how much they actively were resisting God because God's trying to talk to everybody. Um, so I'll let everybody else, uh, well, I guess it's just Luke and Daryl. I heard Paula, she's not even back there right now. Um, I believe it's going straight to hell. Why I need for a judgment? Um, uh, well, I'll, let me let everybody else respond to what I was just talking about. And then, uh, if non-believers go straight to hell... Why need for a judgment? Um, there's two different judgments there. There's a lot in that question to answer. There's a thousand years between the judgments. So, oh, already answered. Okay, good. All right. So, Luke, go ahead. Well, um, Gia commented uh, that uh, the, the lost don't get judged. Uh, they just go into the the second death <clears throat> but uh, the Bible does call that uh, event the great white throne judgment uh, so I think we have to say that there is a judgment made uh, but we also know that um, the Bible says that if you uh, don't believe on Jesus I'm paraphrasing this you don't believe on Jesus you're uh, if you believe on Jesus you're not condemned but if you do not believe on Jesus, you, you are already condemned. So our uh, natural state is con condemnation, and we need to get the condemnation off of us. And we've all done that by our, our faith in Jesus. So we're no longer condemned. So the lost people, when they die and they go to that uh, great white throne judgment, uh, they're really already condemned. The condemnation's never been removed from them. So they're, in fact, really going to be sentenced. But what I think will happen when it says the books will be opened, everything will be revealed. Uh, um, and they will be court, judged according to their works. I think what's going to happen, I can imagine this uh, playing out like their life is, is shown on a screen for them to view. And, and uh, uh, they, they see all the things in their life, all the opportunities that they had to uh, uh, learn about Jesus and receive the gift of salvation uh, all the times that they didn't want to talk about it or mocked it and refused it and all the sins that they did in their life that were charged to Jesus so they can say, look, God loves you so much he paid for all your sins. You're, you're, you're not condemned because of your sin. Jesus paid for your sin. But you refuse to receive the gift of eternal life so you, you don't have immortality. And you're here just to show so that um, 
everybody can see that God is just, that you were given your opportunities. You would not accept the gift of life. Even though Jesus paid for your sins, you have now death still on you. So uh, they're going to, um, the, the greater, when it talks about uh, uh, their degrees of punishment, uh, I don't think anybody gets punished for their sins, even lost, because Jesus took the punishment. He's the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So I don't think people are going into that lake of fire because of sin. I think it's not a sin issue. It's a sun issue, as we like to say. Uh, they did not embrace the sun and get the gift. Uh, and uh, so they basically uh, are going to be shown that, look, he paid for your sins. That's how much he loved you. You wouldn't get the, receive the gift, so they die. And I don't think they're thrown into that lake of fire to torture them or even for a minute. I believe that they die. Uh, they go in there to be discarded for their bodies and souls to be destroyed and perish. Um, that's how I, uh, the conclusions I come to based upon all the scriptures that support those conclusions. But related to the question, the point that you're making with Ayas and Gia's point about uh, they don't get judged there. And in, in a way, you're right. The judgment's already on them. The condemnation's on them. They're there to get sentenced and have this have the uh, sentence executed. Capital punishment. Death. The second death. Right. I'm glad you pointed that out because I, I was not trying to say that... Uh, um, I was not trying to say that uh, people don't know if they're going to heaven or hell before they die. Uh, that's a good point. The judgments is the sentence or the reward. At our judgment, at the judgment seat of Christ, when we get, uh, when we're done with that, um, we will actually be in our heavenly hierarchy to where they'll be the greatest in heaven to the least in heaven. And then um so our judgment makes up uh you know that hierarchy the the lost see i do think that uh i agree with luke that everybody is going to be destroyed um now and at this point we're already past where luke and i disagree luke like you said he doesn't think there's any torture for anybody anytime uh, i think there is uh, in the in the intermediate time between when they all die, when Jesus returns, and when the great white throne judgment is. There's a thousand years there. Um, so I think that during that time they are in the belly of the earth, their souls, and they are waiting judgment, and they are dealing with their sins. Now, when they get thrown into the lake of fire, I do think that they will be destroyed. But maybe those who, uh, maybe the judgment is how long it takes for them to be destroyed. Maybe it is merciful for God to just get rid of them quick. But there are some people that because they did so much against God and uh, led so many people away from Christ that at their great white throne judgment maybe instead of uh, being destroyed into nothing over an instance a moment you know maybe it's uh, some people it takes them five minutes maybe some people it takes them five years maybe some people it takes them five millennia you know, I don't know. Uh, but maybe the degree of uh, how long it takes them to be put out could be what they're judged. But yeah, everybody who goes to the Great White Throne Judgment is already lost. They have the condemnation of hell upon them already because of their unbelief. Uh, they're not going to that judgment with any chance of going to heaven. And then also the saints who go to our judgment, every single one of us who go to that judgment, none of us are have the opportunity to be judged and go to hell.
So, um, oh, <laughs> I was like, who's at my house? But it's Daniel. He's dropping off the car seat, I think. Okay, I think there's something we just need to adjust real quick in chat. What's that? We need to refrain from trying to decide if someone is saved or not. <laughs> Either way, nobody should be making comments about anybody, whether they think they're saved or not. That, that serves no purpose and just can cause strife. So let's not go there, please. Yeah, I, I intended on talking about that, but I, I, I got sidetracked with the judgment there. But uh, I noticed that. I'm glad you brought it up, uh, Daryl. Uh, I'm disappointed to see people in the chat room declaring that someone in there is not saved. Uh, well, whether they are or they aren't, either way, like, it's just there's no need to go there. That's what I just said. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Why, why are we making the judgments whether someone's saved or not? Uh, the only thing that we can should be declaring is uh, your, uh, your confession of faith is correct right now. That's all. Uh, you're, you're, you claim right now, uh, your belief that you're claiming is uh, what is required for salvation right now. Uh, other than that, try, I think beyond that, trying to speculate uh, on anything that's happened in the past is a big mistake. I hate to see that happening here in this uh, congregation. So. I'm trying to use my mute button here on the uh, on my microphone. It gets a little difficult at time, but uh, I actually missed it. I didn't see what was being said there. Um, but uh, I do. As I'm looking at it, I see that Gia and Estevan would like to join. It's easiest if you guys. Well, I can I can do it. I can compose. An email. It's you. Usually, it's easiest if you email me, and then I can respond with uh, with the link. But I think I've got both of you. Oh, you know, it's uh, yeah. G. Oh, there you are. All right. Can I uh, say something more about uh, just to answer the? Uh, out of the desert, he's directing a question to me. I think he's asking about, uh, so you're saying there's no eternal torment. Uh, out of the desert, uh, uh, hi, I, I don't know you, who you are, apparently. Uh, maybe you haven't listened to me much uh, to understand my uh, position on this, but uh, if you listen to my description of the judgment, you should understand that I do not believe that the lost will suffer eternal torment. I don't believe the lost will suffer one minute of torment, as I as I said last time. Uh, but I do believe that the lost will suffer death, second death. Uh, I have a playlist titled "What Is the State of the Dead," and uh, there's two groups. There's uh, two two time frames that are addressed. If I died right now, between my death and the resurrection of, uh, of humanity, that period of time is the, called the intermediate state. The intermediate state of the dead, uh, Matthias uh, thinks that uh, the lost people are being tormented during that period of time. Uh, I believe that they're just waiting. They're waiting for the judgment. Uh, uh, and then uh, when the resurrection comes and there's the great white throne judgment for the lost and the judgment seat of Christ for the saints, uh, that's when the lost, uh, the last time I talked about that judgment, that all that applies. But I, I believe that when, when the lost go into the lake of fire, that they perish. And Jesus said, don't fear him who can destroy your body. Fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. And the most famous verse in the Bible for Christians, John 3.16, says that there's two, two results. 
Uh, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So there will be a group of people who perish, and another Greek group that do not perish, but instead get everlasting life. We who trust to Jesus get eternal life, and those who didn't perish. That means that they perish. I mean, we, we shouldn't, let's not redefine what that means. They no longer exist. Uh, but uh, if you are, uh, if you're, maybe you're uh, convinced that eternal torment is the correct doctrine, I held that viewpoint for 25 years until I changed my mind. Uh, if you are interested in looking at the other side of this argument and uh, want to reconsider your position, there's a, there's actually a website, a YouTube channel called Rethinking Hell. Re that's reconsider your position. If you want to do that, uh, then go to my playlist, What is the State of the Dead? And we, I, I've made up videos and I've collected videos on the subject that would be helpful to you. But there's many people in our congregation who have moved away from the eternal torment position uh, because the scripture support for for eternal torment is almost nothing, and the scriptural support for perishing is enormous. If you're not aware of that, then I hope you'll take the time to, to really study this out. Right. Um, out of the desert, uh, you are new to the, the fellowship here. And uh, actually... Um, you actually have a question that I am trying to get the time to give you a, uh, I give comment responses or email responses. Uh, if somebody sends me an email and asks a question, a lot of times I'll just email it back a, a simple answer, but sometimes I'll actually make videos, uh, short videos for us or anywhere between five minutes and 45 minutes. <laughs> so um, you're, you commented asking what I believe salvation was and then also about somebody in the chat room um, with a couple questions. So uh, I just haven't had the time. I, I want to make an email response or a, a video response for that. And when I do, I will... I don't have your email, but I was going to respond to your comment uh, with a link to the video. So, um, just so you know, you could email me at talkingdoctrine at gmail.com as well. Uh, and that way I can uh, notify you when that gets up. But Gia and Estevan, I uh, did send you guys the link so you can join in whenever. Um... To hell with eternal torment. Uh, I think I've heard Luke say that before. And it's the title of one of my videos. <laughs> so, yes, if you go to his playlist, you'll see it. Uh, to hell with eternal torment. You know, I believed in eternal torment my entire life. Um, and From when I was lost as a Catholic, from when I was lost as agnostic, when I was a lost seeker, when I was born again for the first three years, but the very first time, the very first time that I read the Bible cover to cover, I, I mean, I was saved for three years, I had read a lot of the Bible, but I never sat down and read it cover to cover, but the very first time that I did, one of the uh, major doctrines that I changed right there at the beginning was uh, eternal torment. I just don't think the Bible supports it. So, um, do we have any topics that we want to talk about? And if not, uh, I do have one. So, Esteban and Gia, I did the link. Isn't working. Is there any chance you can call? Okay. Oh, why, why isn't the link? It worked for everybody else. But I think I can call. Uh, A.S. Stevan and G. 
Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna give you guys a couple. I'll give you a minute to open up Hangouts. So when you open up Hangouts, it'll ring whenever I hit the invite for you. But I do have. Um, have you guys seen the? Uh, the terrible display of supposed Christians calling for the execution of the sodomites and they're like gaining steam and getting publicity with it. There was a event just this past weekend that was titled Make America Straight Again. It was the Massa. And, you know, it's ridiculous because it's like they're saying to execute the sodomites there's two things here there's a lot more that god said to execute he said to execute the adulterers why aren't you going after the adulterers the same way you're going after the sodomites if you're if you're biblically um what's the word uh if everything corresponds correctly then you should be um you should be arguing and fighting for the death penalty for a lot more than just sodomy. But another thing is, is what if, um, uh, where in the Bible did they ever do that? Yes, God commanded it. God did ask for uh, it to be done in Leviticus 20. But where is it recorded that they ever did it? Please, show me that in scripture. It's not there. Um, they drove them out. <clears throat> and uh, uh, I think maybe one or two places somebody might have killed one or two. But uh, most of the time, the first things they did was toward, tear down the temples and drive the sodomites out of the land so they didn't just execute all of them so they're these guys are advocating for something that uh, the Jews themselves didn't even do and they were the ones who were following the law at the time so um, we do have uh, Gia and Estevan with us so if uh, if we get a chance later, I'll show you guys a video of how ridiculous it's getting on the topic that uh, that I was just talking about. Um, but uh, uh, we'll see how what time permits. I do want to say hello to the guests, and since Gia, we'll go with ladies first. How are you? It's it's good to finally talk to you. Hi, can hey. you hear me? Can hear you just fine. Okay. <laughs> um, no, I was just uh, just listening in, and I wanted to talk a little bit about eternal damnation. If you guys have not moved from that topic yet, um, or maybe you want no. to me no, 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 about no, no, that's fine. We're still um, that is just fine. I think uh, Esteban's gonna talk about something we were talking about earlier too. But no, that is what. What uh, what do you want to say about eternal damnation, or what questions, or what verses, or where do you want to go with it? Well, I just want to know what exactly is the gnashing of the teeth. Um, at what point do we experience that? Is that before we die? After we die? Well, we as I in, mean, we as in saints, right. we will we will never go through that. Um, as as saints uh now the lost people i you know the gnashing of teeth um what is it uh uh what are the two things something and gnashing of teeth but gnashing of teeth is is anger and it's more like they're angry at themselves uh um 
weeping and gnashing of teeth. Thank you, Paula. <laughs> you could have popped in and said that. Um, but the weeping is the sorrow because of knowing what they've rejected and what they don't have now. The gnashing of teeth is the anger, and I think more so at themselves, especially because at the uh, Great White Throne Judgment, I agree with Luke, it'll be like a movie screen of their whole life, and they'll be shown all the times that they rejected God. Um, they'll be see, They'll see each of the times that we were walking after the Spirit, and that it wasn't us talking to them, but it was actually God speaking through us to them. All things will be revealed to them, and they'll see it as such. And they'll be mad at themselves. They'll be angry at themselves, and knowing that they deserve to be thrown in that lake of fire. So the gnashing of teeth, if you look at when Stephen was killed, he was, um, Stephen was, uh, he was arguing with or he was preaching to them Moses and the story of Jesus through Moses he was and then they got mad at him and started gnashing on him with his with his teeth okay so they they didn't run up and bite him they were just very angry at him so much so that they they killed him does that make sense and and anybody else have something to add to that, Luke or Daryl or Esteban or Paula? Well, I would say that the gnashing of teeth. Uh, I I thought it was always uh, gnashing and teeth meant that they were suffering in pain, but uh, I've also uh, come to believe that uh, it, it's not. It 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 may be that. There, it may be about pain, but more than likely, I think you're correct that it's uh, gnashing teeth as in they're, they're being, still being spiteful and angry and hating God. Hmm. Anybody else? Uh, Daryl, have you thought about it? I don't even know what's going on. I'm just I'm trying to referee the uh, chat room right now. So you guys carry on. I'm going to deal with this here. So can can you hear me? I oh yeah yeah go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not I'm new at this. I'm not sure how to work this thing. Um, so how about the rich man and Lazarus when he was cognizant about everything that was going on? He was thirsty. He was suffering. He wanted to um, tell his brothers and sister, advise them or warn them not to be with him. Um, right. I think that that was what? during, I think that that was during the interme intermediate time. Okay. Like in hell, uh, while lost people are waiting for their judgment. I think they're in the belly of the earth and they're dealing with their sins. Um, but, uh, Luke, Luke dis disagrees. Um, but I, I do think that that story of Lazarus and the rich man actually is, uh, is not a parable. If it is a parable, it's the first, it's the only one that Jesus used the proper name. Um, and then also, uh, it's very deep in how this man would be looking forward through time and space and really looking at the marriage supper of the Lamb when Abraham was hugging Lazarus in his bosom. So it's a very deep passage, but I do think that it is speaking about the intermediate time and the lost people are going to, I think be going through what that rich man was describing. Okay. That makes sense. But Luke, how would you explain it from your view? The, uh, I do think, uh, it's a parable, not a, not a story. And, uh, 
I think Renee also has come to that conclusion. I remember her making a video about that. And I think one of her arguments was that um, it's, it's surrounded by parables. I mean, before and after parables, why would you think that that one is not also a parable? The uh, argument, of course, is that, well, he's, it mentions a person's name, but I don't see anything in scripture saying that if a person's name is mentioned that uh, it, it, it can, uh, cannot be a parable. Um, but uh, I, so I do take the position that it's a parable, but also in, in that particular account, I, I've read some historical uh, writings on it that say that this is not an original uh, parable from Jesus. This was a parable that was uh, a story uh, uh, that was told uh, by the um, um, mm, the rabbis. Uh, the rabbis um, prior to Jesus. It was a popular story, and it, it was the purpose was not about hell and torment. It was it was about uh, the injustice of, of the poor and how uh, the the rich people are being uh, favored, and we. And if you look at it from that perspective, and uh, you get a different lesson from it, uh, it's the un the unjustness of of uh, against the poor people and how the rich people have are favored, rather than being about that. But I, uh, even if it even if it was about um, hell, then it would be uh, as Matthias said, uh, it would be a description of what many people think is. The intermediate state where you have two compartments, paradise and Hades. Paradise is where uh, the, the saved people are waiting for the blood atonement and they're, uh, so they can be taken up to, to paradise. Um, and I believe the Bible uh, does say that, that uh, Jesus went there and took the, like Moses and Elijah and all the, the Old Testament saints that were waiting for this uh, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And uh, so they were waiting in that other compartment called paradise. And whereas the lost people, they would be waiting in the Hades section. Uh, so, um, but were they, are they being tortured in there? Um, you know, I, as I said, I've already said that I don't think that anybody's being tortured. Uh, I, uh, torture is not a part of uh, the God of the Bible's character. Um, the, the judgment of God in the Bible is uh, he is uh, very willing to use capital punishment. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you're not a Christian, you start reading the Bible, uh, many times people will say, well, gee, they, they want to just execute people for nothing. You, you talk back to your parents and you, you get stoned. And you know, every, they, they're quick to want to stone people to death. So, so God is um, uh, quick to use capital punishment. But you don't see in Judaism and uh, Israel and um, their legal system, you don't see imprisonment and you don't see torture. But you do see capital punishment. Um, all right, so, um, that's two different views. Um, Sarah asked in the chat room, uh, what I meant by, what, what exactly I meant by they will be dealing with their sins. And, um, this is just my opinion. I really don't have Bible verse to say this is you know, exactly what happens. But uh, I'm extrapolating it from several verses. But I do think that when Jesus was imputed with our the sins of the world, he took him down to the belly of the earth you know, where he was for three days and three nights. I think he actually left the world's sins there. So maybe everybody has their own compartment. Think of like a jail, jail cell where all their sins, the weight of their sins, it has a weight, a spiritual weight to it, um, actually is in this room holding all their sins. 
So everybody who dies, they go to their holding cell and all their sins are basically sitting there waiting on them. So somebody who dies with a million sins may go in there and be up to their neck in lava or something. Maybe like every sin brings a drop of lava. And so somebody who died with just a hundred sins, their lava only goes up to their ankles. You know, I don't know. I, this is just speculation at this point. But I do think that the sins of everybody were, were left in hell. And God, Jesus didn't come out of the earth with what he got imputed uh, with. So, we as saved saints... The moment we pass from this life, absent from this body, we're present with the Lord. We'll never go to hell and be reunited with our sins. The moment we die, our perfect spirit will be uh, uh, will be directly in front of our Creator. So, I that's what I it's speculation. Um, but yeah, I think that everybody who goes to sin or goes to hell is going to have to deal with each one of their sins. So this gets extreme when you think about all the little girls walking around going, OMG, oh my God. You know, I, I think just even putting the abbreviation is blaspheming God and they don't even know it. And kids nowadays, I mean... They're racking up at least a hundred a day of blasphemy points because of how much they say that phrase. Uh, so that's just my perspective. I get that Luke would disagree with it um, from from his view, but uh, uh, you know, um, I don't know what. Uh, uh, Estevan would think, and Daryl's busy. So, Estevan, what what would you uh, say to, you know, where do you line up in this conversation? And then, what question is it that you were you were asking? Excuse me. Um, sorry about that. I was eating my birthday cake right now. <laughs> um. Uh, for 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 uh, this, I I would have to. I don't really know. I don't really know. I. I I'm in between right now. If it's eternal uh, conscious torment, which I really don't know if that would be uh, the sovereignty of God and the whole eternal uh, death, uh, the second death. Um, So I I really don't know. I I, I don't know how to answer this question. Um, So I, I think I'd rather just leave it at that right now. Well, no, that's fine. I mean, seeking um, deeper things in Scripture is always a good thing. And not acting like you know something is even better. So, just keep in the Word and He'll show you eventually. And there's no need to jump on either side until He does. Let me me answer uh, Rich Bob. Uh, He's saying that... uh, to uh, uh, take uh, to the position against eternal torment, you have to basically ignore uh, the book of Revelation. And um, there's only a, a couple of verses that people can use to support eternal torment, and they are in the book of Revelation. First of all, the book of Revelation is uh, apocryphal. Um, apocryphal uh, is a style of writing that is very symbolic. A lot of writing at that time uh, and the century a few centuries before the book of revelation was written the style of writing apocryphal used used a lot of um, real dramatic style of writing about dragons and fires and stuff and it was the, it was a style of writing but i think the book of revelation is is something that we have to uh, i am very very slow to get dogmatic about my positions on the book of Revelation. I think I've probably studied it as much or more than anybody listening right now. 
Uh, I've studied the book of Revelation one verse at a time from uh, the top authority of presenting it from a preterist viewpoint. Um, another time I've gone through it verse by verse with the top authority uh, for the uh, historical interpretation of it. And then I've studied it exhaustively from the uh, futuristic viewpoint. And that's the, that's the viewpoint I held for 25 years. And I'll tell you that um, the, quote, scholars uh, that dedicate their life to focusing just on this end times prophecy, uh, they're all very convincing. They're all very knowledgeable. And each time you listen to one, it's almost like you get one over to their viewpoint and then you listen to the other one, you're one of their, because they're, uh, it's really very subject to interpretation. And so uh, I think if a person wants to get real dogmatic about the book of Revelation, it's a very risky thing to, to do. Uh, I have opinions because I've, I've listened to all the different viewpoints on it. I've listened to it. I've carefully considered it all. So I've come to some conclusions, but I will not teach the book of Revelations. Of all the books I've taught and comment about, just I'll never do a verse by verse teaching on it like as I've done with other books because I am not that, that confident uh, in, in my conclusions. Uh, but I will say that I think you're wrong, uh, Rich Bob, that uh, in terms of you have to ignore it because we, we do have answers for the, the eternal torment support verses that you find in the book of Revelation. We have answers. You might not like our answers, but we answer those, those verses. Uh, we interpret them in a way that it, uh, it, uh, it explains away the eternal torment. But uh, what you need to consider and anybody else if you want to be fair to yourself, is uh, what about 50 or 100 verses that that deny eternal torment, uh, that, that support the idea that the, the lost, the fate of the lost is perish. Uh, now, in, in the playlist that I prepared on, on that subject, uh, I cite at least 50 or 100 verses. And so, um, on one side, eternal torment, you have three or four verses, and we think we have a good explanation for those. On, on, the, uh, the, on our side, the verses that are against eternal torment, we have many, many, many verses, but most people, they don't know about it. They, 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 don't, they don't realize there's all these verses that are against eternal torment. So uh, I changed my mind, not because of uh, any emotional reasoning that some people might think. I changed my mind because the Bible, the Bible says that people perish, they're destroyed, and uh, they're turned to dust. They are no more over and over again a hundred times. Hey, Gia. Um I yes. know you're. I know you're new at it. Are you on a uh, computer or a phone? I'm on an iPad. iPad. Okay. Um, you see the um, the the hang up button in the middle, and then you've got the camera. You shut the camera off, but there's a mute button on the opposite side of the of the hangout button. Hang up button. Whenever you're not talking, do you mind if you could mute? and then unmute and we can actually see it and that'll give us a flag saying hey you want to say something but then when you're moving the iPad around it won't be so ruffle like we, we won't hear it so much is that okay it, it's okay Did I... it, it, it's not a problem at all it's some it's a learning curve that we all go through when we start talking on these things but yeah okay it's kind of like a walkie-talkie you just uh, you leave it muted when you're not talking and then when you want to talk, just unmute yourself and we just bring you right into the conversation. Does that make sense? Am I muted, am I muted now? Nope. Nope. Not now. Like if you tap the screen, you the buttons will appear. Okay. So I see. So I click on it, but it doesn't, it doesn't strike it out. Uh, really? Let me, it's just, it's just like a, a flash comes out that says hang out and then the ipad well, and but, i have the volume all the way down and right I didn't see 
Maybe I'll do it with my own physical, the physical button on my iPad. Let me see. Oh, no, that'll pull you out of it. That'll pull you out of it. Uh, okay. Right. I don't know what to say. Let me see. Nosh. That's okay. Um, let's see. I used to have an iPad. She uh, muted herself. I, I see it right here. Oh, you got it. Awesome. Okay, and then if you if you figured it out, then just unmute yourself whenever whenever you have something to chime in. So uh, no worries at all. It wasn't a big deal. Uh, just for the broadcast, for the viewership, so that they don't have... There you go. You got it. You're unmuting and muting. We can see it perfectly. So you got it. Um, okay. Uh, wait a minute. When I'm on mute, are you hearing me now? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. So when it's highlighted, I'm muted. Gotcha. Thank you. You're welcome. There you go. You're muted. So perfect. It it it's hard to get a hang of, and there'll be plenty of time, plenty of times, where you'll probably start talking and still be muted. But you'll get used to it. But Esteban, yeah, go ahead. Um, so I, my question is, <clears throat> when it talks about backsliding and stuff in the Bible, it doesn't technically use that term, but, um, what, when is it too far to where God's like, okay, I have to send you home now. It's, it's, it's over. You're, you're done. I can't, you know, um, and for, 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 that's for the believer, but for a non-believer, not backsliding, but like. When is it too far for them to where he's like, you know, it's just death to them. They, they, they had their opportunity and they just didn't want to, they kept denying them. Um, does he allow them to live a whole life of denial or, you know, um, there's just some questions I've had about it. Right. Okay. So the second one, that one you're going, you're going too deep into God's mind that we won't get. Why do some people have so much less time than others? And um, why do the wicked uh, uh, prosper and live for a long time? Um, now you're getting into really uh, the mindset that of which we'll never comprehend. The first one, when is for the saint? For when they take, when God will say, when is it too much and take you home? Uh, that's called a sin unto death. And when you disobey your parents. I'm just kidding. Uh, that's an extreme, very extreme thing. God doesn't do that very often. Um, the punishment will never supersede the disobedience so you mess up a little 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 he's never gonna say okay now come home you gotta be messing up big and doing it a lot and totally uh rejecting uh god's warnings uh it's not just gonna come out of the blue he'll probably put you close to your deathbed before anything uh, but again, um, this is between God. He knows when, but I would say that if any saint was going into unnatural sin or any saint that was acting so wickedly towards people, that was tarnishing the name of Christ, causing many people to go to hell. That might be one of the reasons that he... Uh, I would think that if that was going on, that God would just knock the person down. But um, I don't know exactly. I don't think that there's a, uh, there's a biblical reference to go on to say there is a certain point. I just pray that n none of you guys or myself ever get there. I pray not that I forget how John put it. 
There is a sin unto death, though. So, um, it's not anything that you should be worried about. You slip up and uh, uh, lust over some girls or something. It's not like, oh, God, I did it again. Please don't kill me. <laughs> Please don't take me home. It's not, it's not like that. The, the, the punishment isn't going to outweigh the disobedient. The, so... Um, Luke or Daryl, do you guys have anything you want to add or say to what Esteban was just saying? Uh, the only examples I can think of, uh, I think Ananias and Sapphira would be an example. Uh, and what did they do that was worthy of death was uh, Peter said, you lied to the Holy Spirit. They, they lied about uh, selling their property and giving all the money to the church when they only gave half of it to the church. And of course, we're not supposed to get out of that, that you got to give everything to the church. Uh, Peter says it didn't matter how much you gave, what, but what mattered was you're lying about it. You lied to the Holy Spirit. So in that case, uh, they were taken, uh, their life was taken. Uh, in the Old Testament, there are some examples of pe God killing people, and it was uh, had to do with the altar and uh, the sacrifices and, and, and not following the protocol that God laid out. Uh, um, God was very serious about following those rules for the, the sacrifices, so I don't remember all the details, but uh, there were at least two or three occasions where people were struck dead because they they touched the wrong thing. Uh, but in now here, in this, uh, here for the church, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be worried about that. I would be concerned about, it. I, uh, as I said, there's only one example in the Bible and uh, it's not something that happened a lot. I don't think anybody should be afraid of it. I agree with uh, not being afraid of it. Daryl, I know you're dealing with stuff in the chat room. And you know what? Maybe we should address some things, too. Because, <coughs> um, uh, Zach, welcome, by the way. You're kind of new to the to the fellowship here. And then um, out of the desert, I think that's who it was. Um, uh Welcome to you too. I know that uh, I think you came over with the whole Noah Noah Hines crew, and you're more than welcome to be here. And I'm happy to to uh, converse with you. But please uh, don't cause um, strife and discord. Uh, you know, I mean, I I don't think anybody's. Um, trying to be an accuser here we usually have very mellow very edifying chat room i mean this is kind of a uh, an unusual thing that, that we're seeing in here tonight so uh zach welcome it's not normal that it's like that and i get that uh, you guys might be getting under each other's skin but uh, i guess if you guys both would relax a little bit from what I see, um, uh, and then also I think I see some, uh, uh, stuff going on between Mike and Jessica, both of you guys, please calm down, I'm not getting on to anybody, I'm just saying, hey, we, uh, we, <laughs> we can fellowship here and, and not be going, arguing, uh, back and forth, so, if there's anything that we really need to address, we certainly will. But um, uh, I don't think anybody's out to get anybody. Uh, this is the first time there's been really contention in the chat, and I would almost say a couple of years or a year, <laughs> you know. So uh, everybody's welcome. We all, whether we agree on doctrine or not, I would say that we all strive to want to know Jesus more and we can rally and gather around that and just be respectful 
if nonetheless. Yep. Let me say something, because I was looking at the, the series of comments back and forth, and uh, Zach expressed the uh, disgust that uh, in, the, in the idea that uh, God would uh, torment people forever and ever, would make God into some cruel, sadistic God. Um, and uh, Mr. Richbob was offended by that. Well, I'm, I'm, I don't think that, uh, I, I've said the same thing many times. I believe the eternal torment uh, turns the God of the Bible that I love, the God of love, mercy, and justice into an evil, sadistic, cruel torturer. And I don't, I'll say that, and if it offends someone, then all I can say back to you is that you're, um, anybody who believes in a total torment, that, that God of the Bible would actually do that, to me, I consider that to be an, an insult against my God, the God of the Bible. And I tolerate that. I'm not saying Bob or anybody else who believes in internal torment, you don't have to agree with my conclusions on it. We, 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 we don't have to unify around that. We have liberty. And we should have liberty to be able to express it. That, look, you, you think that uh, eternal torment is perfectly uh, fine and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't impair, I guess, uh, against the, uh, uh, the character of God. And uh, I and Zach and others think it does. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a stain on the character of God as we see it. So neither side should be offended by that position. I, um, but uh, we equally have the right to be offended because uh, of how people are, are they're, what they're making our God into is, is uh, offensive to me. And yet I don't speak about it. I don't try to say, wow, you're insulting the God of the Bible. You don't hear me say it unless the subject comes up like this. But we're talking about this. You're free to believe that that's who God is. I'm a free, free to think that that's a, a horrible depiction of the God of the Bible. We should be able to just uh, tolerate that with each other. Can I say something real please, quick? Please do. Um, I think we are reacting about this whole eternal damnation, like the way they... Um, Apostle Peter reacted when Jesus was ready to go and die at the cross. At face value, it looks really bad. It's like, no, Lord, no, 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 you're not going to die. This is not going to happen. And he had to say, get thee behind me, Satan. I think this is my opinion. When we all be with him, he's going to give us that option that we didn't even think about because right now we see through a a glass darkly. So I think at that throne when we're all together and he said, you know, this is what I did with those people. And we're going to be like one big sight. Oh, okay. I see you were just and doing that particular thing. In other words, he hasn't told us everything. So as far as whether they're going to suffer forever or suffer for a hundred years or suffer for 10 minutes or 10 hours, I don't think we that's like above us i think he's gonna be just in whatever he does that's how i kind of put it to rest right and with that i can concur and with what was being said in the chat um i think that that would bring everybody to an agreement because uh both luke and i we used to believe in eternal torment um, Luke longer than I as a saved person and we didn't um, uh, um, what's the word uh, you didn't beat each other over the head well no 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 <laughs> right right we didn't have um, uh, an issue with saying God you know if that's God's if that's what he says to, he's going to do, well, then he's just in whatever he says he's going to do. 
And we just have to know that God's ways are not our own. And just trust that, like what Gia just said, it would be just. And so I did. I, for the first three years of being saved, and I believed in eternal torment, I was just fine saying that that's, if that's what God says. But now that I've read the Bible as much as I have, um, I don't think the Bible teaches that. And so um, I agree with Luke. The more and more I see, read in Scripture, a torture God or a tormenting God doesn't seem to be like the one that lines up with Scripture. Um, but uh, if it is, Let's say I'm wrong, and he is going to torment people. Then, if that's what he says is just, I agree then. Uh, I'm not going to say that my morality is greater than God's. It's not. My morality may not be the same as God's. It's not. Nobody's morality is the same as God's. But who's right, us or God? God's right. And the problem with most people is they're not humble enough to admit that. So if eternal torment is the case, and what I see in scripture is incorrect, I'm not going to go around saying, well, God, you're unjust for doing that. It's not going to hurt my feelings if he thinks that that is what's just. I'm going to say, okay, I need to align what, what I think with what God says. But I just don't think God says that. I think that what he says is that his mercy endureth forever. And that the perishing, the second death, uh, the Bible, people say that the Old Testament doesn't talk about hell ever. And they're right. It doesn't talk about hell. But the end of what comes of the wicked is in the Old Testament a lot. And it's destruction, destroyed, put out, no more. It's uh, just because hell's not talked about doesn't mean what the lost people are looking forward to, for lack of better words. Um, They they know. So, sorry, Estevan, go. Um... So, in the Old Testament, hell's not really talked about. So, so how come how come there's a how come they talk more about hell in the New Testament than the Old Testament? Uh, well, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but no, hell is not talked about in the Old Testament. What, uh, what's talked about in the New Testament a lot? Uh, that's translated as hell is the grave and different things but um but no there's you you won't find any real doctrine of hell in the old testament that's that's very interesting to me cuz like um so is that where you guys get the whole uh second death too like do you guys see foreshadows or something in the old testament somewhere that maybe i overlooked oh there's tons of foreshadows for the second death in the old testament that's what i'm saying like put in uh uh, wicked you're gonna get that's too broad of a search put destroy wicked or destroy asterisk, you know, so you'll get the destroyed, destroyed, destroying. Um, so if you put in destroy asterisk, wicked, uh, and read just those seven or eight verses that pop up, you'll get a good, a good explanation of what happens to the wicked when they die. Uh, I've, got the, I've got my notes on my teaching on it in front of me. I don't, it's not my intention. Someone else, I, I think that when someone asked about the judgment, I think it was uh, Gia 
said that there's no um, uh, judgment for the lost. There's just a second death. So that that's what started the move the conversation to this subject. Uh, it's not something I wanted to bring up and 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 take over the uh, the uh, discussion tonight and make it about this. But I've got many verses in front of me. I can quote. I can give you 50 verses right now that, that would, uh, if you're not aware of them, it'll blow your mind. But uh, I always just say, I, I don't like to get into um, going back and forth trying to win an argument with someone. Not, I'm not trying to persuade anybody. That's why I make videos and make playlists. So I, I just ask, watch my playlist. What is the state of the dead? And you'll see. We go over many, many verses in the Old Testament, just as Matthias said. The Old Testament says over and over again, what, what is going to happen to the to the, the lost people? What is their fate? And uh, it's it's not being tortured. It's, uh, but I'll, I'll, I've got the verses here if you want me to go over them. Otherwise, I do, just... I do. But real quick, let me just correct myself because when I said hell wasn't in the Old Testament, I was meaning the concept of a burning, tortury, fire place. The word hell is used in the Old Testament, so I didn't mean to to be misleading, but it's speaking about the grave. I was speaking of the concept of what people say hell is, is not spoken about when it talks about the lost, the, the, the end of the wicked. So I just wanted to... Uh, add that in there, Luke, just so people didn't say that I was, uh, you know, misquoting scripture. I was talking about the concept, not necessarily the word. But yeah, go ahead, Luke. Okay, I'll, I'll just read some of these here. Uh, um, um, well, I'm, I'm not going to read the verse. These are all Old Testaments. I'll give you the verse addresses if you want, but uh, just to save time. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The Lord thy God is a consuming fire. Understand therefore this day that the Lord thy God is he which goeth over before thee as a consuming fire. He shall destroy them and he shall bring them down before thy face. So shalt thou drive them out and destroy them quickly as the Lord hath said unto thee. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb, for evildoers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth for yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be, for the wicked shall perish and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume, into smoke shall they consume away. The ungodly are not so, but are like the shaft which the wind driveth away. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, and thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Thou shalt make them as a fiery oven in the time of thine anger. The Lord shall swallow them up in his wrath, and the fire shall devour them. Let them melt away as the waters which run continually when he bendeth his bow to shoot his arrows. Let them be as cut in pieces. As a snail which melteth, let every one of them pass away, like the untimely birth of a woman, that they may not see the sun. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melteth before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. O oh my God, make them like a wheel as the stubble before the wind. And he shall bring upon them their own iniquity and shall cut them off in their own wickedness. Yea, the Lord our God shall cut them off. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked. O God, depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. For the moth shall eat them up like a garment, and the worm shall eat them like wool. But my righteousness shall be forever, and my salvation from generation to generation. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, 
that it shall leave them neither root nor branch, and ye shall tread down the wicked, and for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. In the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord, all flesh shall perish, and man shall turn into dust. And then there's New Testament verses too, but those are some Old Testament verses. And the picture we get from that uh, is not that they're going to be living forever in a state of torment. Um, also, uh, I just wanted to say too, in uh, Revelation 20, verse 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. I mean, that's a clear statement right there. Uh, I just saw it right now in Revelation, so I just wanted to bring that one up real quick. Yeah, to me, to me that's telling me that the lake of fire and hell is not going to exist in, in, in eternity. Uh, uh, people are destroyed in the lake of fire, and then following that, we have uh, the the heavens melt away with, with fervent heat, and God creates new heavens and new earth, but it doesn't say God's going to create a new lake of fire for the people to continue to be tortured, does it? Okay, um, so that's comforting to know, actually. So basically, the hell or that place where they are held, is that going to be that a thousand years that they're going to realize they're not going to inherit eternal life and that's where the gnashing of the teeth is? They that, are conscious? That is what I believe, yes. That is, that is, the, that is what I believe. Uh, Luke doesn't think so. Luke thinks that he, he's not sure. He said that earlier. He's not sure about the intermediate time. Uh, but, um, uh, but yeah, so that's not going to get thrown in. Um, well, you know, I'll let him answer. Like, uh, where's, I think I answered correctly, but where's the gnashing of teeth for you again? It's, I think it's in the gospels. Oh, no, no. I was talking about for, uh, for Luke's position. Where does he, where does he put the gnashing of teeth? I uh, I will have to I mean to be certain I'd have to look at it in the context where it is but I, I'm I'm assuming that's talking about at the judgment of the lost when they're uh, they're uh, they're weeping because look they see how some people will be weeping doesn't mean necessarily that the same person is weeping and gnashing some people may be weeping some people may be gnashing but at the that at their judgment when they're shown all the things they did. And yet their sins were paid for by this loving God and Savior, Jesus. Uh, and, and yet they rejected him and refused his gift of eternal life their entire life. And so they're shown all the opportunities they had to get this gift of eternal life, and they would not accept it. Uh, they will be weeping, and some will be gnashing their teeth, still hating God, in spite of all this love and mercy he bestowed upon them. So I think that's how that will play out. But the, uh, the, uh, the thousand years, that gets us into a totally different place. Uh, and that's, that's, a, <laughs> that's another can of worms because uh, you have a, uh, the millennial question is you have a millennial, not, uh, post-millennial and pre-millennial. I'm not going to try to define them all. But the position that Matthias holds and most people in America today hold and that I held for 25 years is called premillennialism. In other words, that uh, all these events in the Bible, uh, the, um, the, uh, the rapture, the, 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 the uh, uh, tribulation, the second coming, all this happens. And then this happens pre or prior to the millennial kingdom. And Jesus will set up a thousand year kingdom on earth and then uh, Satan's release. So that's that's pre-millennialism. And uh, I, I, that's what I was taught. That's what I've got all kinds of books on it. And I, I respected the teachers that, that taught me and, and they were very respected and I just accepted what they taught. Until about seven years ago, I decided I needed to listen to the other side of these arguments. And as I studied the other side, I came to the conclusion that premillennialism is not correct. That that, that we are either, that either the correct position is amillennialism or postmillennialism, 
and and there's a very little difference between them. But um, we're going to have a, a talk on um, Friday night with uh, Brother Doctor Jason Jack at uh, 8:30 p.m. Eastern time, following the Fundamental Friday program on Flat Earth. And if you, uh, we're going to be talking about a thousand years that was added to the calendar that is brother jason jack is speculating that when pope gregory did change the calendar and to the gregorian calendar that a thousand years was added so his theory is that it's not really 2019 the year is 1019. now i know that sounds crazy when i first heard it i thought it sounded crazy but he's made a lot of videos on it and there's a lot of uh uh, uh, evidence that he's offered to support it that's pretty compelling. Uh, so we're going to talk about that. But on that night, this subject of amillennialism or postmillennialism is part of that conversation. So if you join us then, we, we can define better what amillennialism and post or, or postmillennial is. And I believe those are the proper ways of understanding the millennium rather than the, the, the pre-millennial position that Matthias and, and Rene and I and most of us have held. The pre-millennial position was really established in the 19th century by uh, 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 John Nelson Darby and uh, got put into the Schofield Reference Bibles. So all the seminaries adopted it because the notes in the Schofield Reference Bible all were interpreting scriptures according to Darby's teaching about uh, end times. Uh, so that's why in America today, uh, the popular viewpoint is like in the movies that we've seen and the books we've read about, uh, you know, Left Behind. Uh, that, that scenario of events in Left Behind where there's a rapture, a tribulation, second coming, and then a millennial kingdom and all that, that's, that's part of uh, dispensational futurism. Now, I don't know if I would necessarily be called premillennial, possibly, because uh, I'm not exactly sure how that's categorized, but uh, I don't think that there's a, you know, I'm very last day post-tribber, and I don't think there's a kingdom on this earth. Oh, yeah, that's right. You are unique in that. But you do think that this millennial kingdom, even though it's not earthly, it's off in some other dimension or or something. Uh, you do think it comes following all the other events, like the uh, the, uh, the 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 rapture, the tribulation, the second coming. Uh, all those things happen prior to this millennial kingdom. Is that correct? Okay. Y yes. Okay. So so I guess that would be premillennial. Um, You're premillennial, but the difference is you don't think it's earthly. Right, and I don't think I don't put kingdom. I don't put a kingdom to the thousand year reign. I don't think yeah. kingdom is there. I think the kingdom is now. Yeah, you know, yeah, I that, think that, that, that that's the position of a millennials and 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 post millennials. The kingdom is now, as Jesus said, do not do not say low here and low there. Uh, uh, the, the the kingdom is it's within as, you. Yeah, it can't. Yeah, it's it's, it's not something power. you can see and recognize. It's a spiritual kingdom that's within us, and it started in the beginning of the church, and 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 right. it, yeah, it continues on to, to today. We're right. in the kingdom Jesus, right now. Jesus said that he wouldn't eat and drink with him until he came in his, in the kingdom, and when he rose, yeah. he sat down and ate and drank with him. You know, yeah. so it's like here's the kingdom. Um, yeah. And he said, some of you will not taste death till you see the, <laughs> the kingdom of God come with power. So, yeah. So I have a, in addition to the playlist I'm asking everybody to watch on, what is the state of the dead? I have a playlist titled Dispensationalism, Futurism, Preterism, Historicism, the Millennium, and the Rapture. Uh, those are the subjects of that. It's all end times uh, questions, uh, theology, and I have a playlist on that. Uh, so... You can go watch that playlist. There's a lot, lot involved in this. Uh, but, we'll uh, see. But okay, so really, I want to ask one more time: Would I fall in as a premillennialist with me thinking that the kingdom is now? Uh, no, I, I don't know. You really don't fit in any of the boxes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting. So right, I. Uh, I'm happy that you and I we are in agreement that the kingdom is now, 
uh, but this thousand years, see, I think the thousand years is um, just like there's a thousand uh, cattle on a thousand hills. It's just talking about a, a long period of time before the, um, the second coming. But uh, see, I think Jack, Jason Jack says, well, maybe the thousand years is literal, but we haven't been a thousand years until the thousand until uh, one thousand and thirty. Uh, uh, that's when you have a thousand years after Jesus's ministry, or a thousand thirty-three, or when his death, burial, and a thousand years from his death, burial, and resurrection. So that's coming up pretty soon. Uh, that thousand, if if it's not twenty nineteen, it's actually one thousand nineteen. <laughs> right. See, for me, I think that especially with the flat Earth and it being like a clock, it's a clockwork up in the cosmos, and I think it's counting down. And when we get to exactly the 6,000 year mark of creation, that that will be the exact moment that the sky rolls back like a scroll and every eye sees Jesus descend. And then it'll be another thousand years, which will be the lat like representing the day God rested, where there's really nothing going on on earth. Everyone's either up in glory or down in hell and the earth is getting its sabbath as god said he said he was going to do but then after the thousand years that would bring all of creation to seven thousand years which would mimic the seven day creation so that's why i actually think but see i also add in how peter says a day with the lord is like a thousand years a thousand years is as a day so I think when we get caught up that day, the very last day, we're going to go to the judgment seat of Christ, and we're going to go to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then God maybe take us around New Jerusalem, and it'll feel like we were there a day, and it'll actually have been that thousand years. So like we're up in glory. He went to go prepare a place, and he said he was going to bring us to it. And so he, when he does, we're in such excitement. What's really a thousand earthly years feels like a day. Like that verse comes in literal. So then, then we see Revelation 20. We're still in the city as it's descending down from heaven and looking at all that stuff happening through the uh, crystal sea, the uh, pure gold floor. You know, you can see straight through it. So that's that, that's just what I see. Um, but the thousand years actually fits in perfectly with the whole creation fitting in with the seven days creation. Also with Peter, it'll only feel like a day. Um, but, uh, you know, that's Zach, just really Zach, speculation. Can, uh, Matthias, Zach is asking you uh, if your position on the clock uh, is that a conflict with not knowing the day or the hour? No, not at all. Um, because one of the things is is that we can't read that clock. Where God's time is on the lunar cycle. So God's day is actually an, almost an hour shorter than man's day. So man has gone ahead quite a bit with a 24-hour day going an hour ahead a day each day um if you look at the difference between the jewish the lunar calendar and the gregorian calendar the solar calendar uh that'll show you basically it adds up to um a 360 day year or a 365 day year so while i do think when that clock strikes zero It'll be the moment that the sky cracks open. Um, but I just don't think anybody can read that clock except for God. Not even the angels who are part of the clock can read it. Uh, but I do think that it's such a beautiful set of clockwork up there. And it's just ticking down to uh, to T minus here comes Christ. <laughs> so, um, 
Uh, I, it doesn't. It does not affect. Nobody knows the day or hour because nobody can read the clock but God. But we can see it. We can look at it. We can admire it. But if anybody can say they can read the constellations and know what time they are in God's timing, I would say they were lying. <laughs> now, Rich Bob is saying idea. He's got an idea. Flat Earth sundial. Uh, but Rich Bob, I, I don't know how much you paid attention to this flat Earth subject, and, but there are a lot of people uh, in the flat Earth uh, community that's gotten quite enormous, actually. But uh, many of these people are producing merchandise of clocks uh, showing the flat Earth. There's a lot of real interesting uh, um, things that people have come up with uh, using the clock and the flat Earth idea together. So yeah, check that have out. You, have you not seen my flat Earth clock and my idea? I think I think I did. Yes. Um, I don't have any mechanical mechanisms to it. But I can accurately depict where the sun is, depending on what time it is, for me. I can look at a clock and have it uh, point to the hour. And the thing that's pointing is actually holding the sun. And it's over a particular geographic spot. And every hour, it lines up perfect. I've already checked it out. So you could get a 24-hour clock and put it over the sun, put it over the flat earth disk and it'll show you where the sun is. You could also get a 23.24 hour whatever clock and for the moon cycle and you put it on a 24-hour clock and have it run and it will show you exactly where the moon is at any given time because it'll it just keeps going in the in the same 23 hour day it doesn't slow down or speed up like the sun does and then if you could take a con the constellations and go to 22 hours because they are a little slower than the moon you could actually get a three mechanism clock and if you had the constellations span spanned out over the disk and a uh, clock crystal spinning that dome and you had the constellations and 12 equal parts on it you could line it up to where you could look at this clock and see exactly where the big dipper the moon and the sun were at any given moment whether it was day or night because you know how you can't even see the stars during the day but they're actually there well this clock would actually show you which stars are in the part where the sun is right now and which stars are in the part where the dark is right now and you could set it up and it would work perfectly and you if if somebody built this clock nobody could deny the flat earth and the reason why i haven't is because it's just too expensive i can buy a 24-hour timepiece for the sun i can buy a 24-hour timepiece for the moon pretty cheap for like less than 20 bucks a piece but nobody has ever made a crystal a timepiece for the constellations so because it would actually be manufacturing a new timepiece crystal we're looking at 15 grand so uh i kind of gave up at that point because I, I have never had 15 grand laying around um so, but if we could make that timepiece, once you make the crystal, then you can make as many timepieces for less than 20 bucks a piece. But manufacturing the crystal is the big thing. I, I don't know if anybody has made exactly your model. Uh, I actually, I would not be surprised if they had made something very comparable to that because so much has been done um, by these inventors. But Rich Bob, that's interesting. He, he, Matthias, he says, I have been flat since 2014. Wow, 2014. I've been flat since maybe, I don't know, maybe six months. It took me about a year of studying it, and then so that was about six months ago that I was uh, convinced. Yeah, I met but, Rich uh, Bob. Yeah, Rich Bob, he said he's one of the pioneers. Um, Matthias, when did you uh, change your mind about the shape of the earth? What year was it? Um 
it was uh well the shape of the earth 2013 uh and the heliocentric model 2012 okay. i was a geocentrist yeah. first yeah but actually uh matt he actually started coming around from the d13 broadcast and that was focused on the flat earth so that's actually how he found yeah. found me back then yeah okay because when I first got on Internet Ministry, that that's pretty much all we talked about yeah. was flat Earth and. Uh... But I I will say I I have uh, I haven't been on board as long as you and uh, Matt, but um, I probably caught up in terms of the amount of time I've spent studying it. I I bet you I've watched five hundred or a thousand hours of videos on it. I still continue watching them every day. I just. I'm still fascinated with it. So uh, there's uh, the nice thing now is years ago there was not very many places to go to get information, but now there's just so many great uh, people that are producing great videos on the subject now. When I was first looking into it, the only people who had videos on YouTube about it were atheists making fun of the Bible because they said the Bible was a flat Earth book. Yeah, that that was the there yeah. and then there was one video where they had a very crude drawing of the flat earth and all they did was have a robo voice speaking all the flat earth verses but it went on for like 45 minutes you know yeah. um those were the only two videos that were out back in 2013 on the flat earth now so i agree with you you you've probably had more study on the flat earth than I have because um, I had already gotten to the point to where I was convinced and I wasn't going to be pushing it uh, alongside the gospel. I mean, I believe it, but I wasn't going to be pushing it. I believe that long before there was a whole bunch of material even online for it. Yeah. So... Yeah, I would say yeah. you probably could could uh, talk about it probably more fluent than I could even right now. And we'll find that out for sure on Friday. Can Can yeah. I also ask a question about this as well? Yeah. With the flat earth and all that? Um, so wait, if it's, it's a, if it's a flat earth, and I'm just saying, if it is, then, then where would hell be? Because, I mean, if there's no, like... Um, you know, inner inner areas in the earth to where All right, it's well, like think, a circle. Here, here, think about this. Think of a ball. Okay. Uh-huh. And cut the ball in half. And uh-huh. so if you're looking down on that bottom half, the round part that you're looking at is the face of the circle of the earth. But you still have all the rest of that half of the ball underneath it. interesting does that make sense yeah it makes sense i mean that's 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 the belly of the earth right there basically we're in a and then the top half of the ball that's your uh that's your looking glass molten looking glass the bible calls it the firmament where the stars are and that's what the top of the ball is what spins the bottom of the ball stays stationary Huh. Okay. Oh, uh, and Zach Richardson says hell is part of a spiritual realm, not physical. Oh, uh, I'm not saying it's a physical realm. Um, but it I was is just in a wondering... physical place. It is in a physical place. It, it is spiritual. He's right. But that spiritual realm is in a physical place, which is the belly of the earth. Um, but the, you're both correct on that different dimension that's true the devils are not extraterrestrial they're gonna come and try to be fake aliens when they come and say they're extraterrestrial but they're not extraterrestrial they're extra dimensional how many dimensions are there i don't think there's many i think that there's one veil between the first heaven and the second heaven i think the first heaven is the physical the second heaven is the spiritual and both of those are inside of time 
and inside of the firmament. And so the spirit realm is walking along right next to the physical. It's just there's this veil between it. And the physical can, first heaven cannot see into the second. But the second can see into the first. Uh, we battle not with flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, and spiritual wickedness in high places. And then the third heaven, I believe, is outside of time, outside of the firmament. It's above the dome. It's actually in God's throne room. It's in eternity. And it is uh, uh, where God uh, resides physically in the third Uh, heaven. um, Even though God is a spirit. So, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. No, you're okay. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have even said anything. Um, but my my other question too is, when cause somebody just asked right now if you can do a alien broadcast, um, that would be interesting actually. Um, and on top of that too, to speak about aliens, our extra dimensional beings, which are the um the fallen uh, or demons or you know all those um. I've seen pictures of people when they were on drugs. <laughs> they drew these like uh, lizard type looking people with many eyes. Uh, wh- what would you say about that? Would that be like a fallen angel or would that be more like a demonic presence? That would be, and this actually goes to what I'm saying. You're talking about DMT. There's scientific evidence of these people who have no background. They didn't know each other, no common background at all. They go to a scientific lab. They both take this DMT, and they both see the same entities in the room. So the entities are devils, the spiritual wickedness. They could be fallen angels, or they could be the devils. There's two different types, but uh, they're both in the spirit realm. So when they take that DMT, I believe it rips the veil away. And they are looking right into the second heaven. Everything spiritual, just like the story with Elijah. And the people coming to go against Elijah and his... uh, Or Elisha. Uh, But uh, they're coming to attack him and uh, the his helper guy that he had with him was all scared and Elisha was like Lord please open his eyes so that he could see and because he was like there's more with us than there are that are against us and he was able to see all the chariots of fire all the angels that were there in the second heaven so the veil was taken away he could see into the spirit realm and see the action that was going on there. Wow. Um, that's awesome. Uh, and on top of that too, um, w- would it be weird for me to say too that I think I'm becoming a flat earther? And the reason why too, it's not just because of the Bible, but... Um, uh, it's kind of, I, I keep telling, talking about dreams, but I keep having all these dreams, man, and I don't know what to say about them. Um, one was where I saw the, the, the bulls, the bulls being poured out on the earth. Um, and in the dream, I saw a flat earth. It was, it was so weird. It, it, everything's pitch black, and then you see all these lights of these beings. I don't really know what the heck they, the angels, I guess you can call them. And the bowls being poured out on the earth. Um, so that was a dream. And then you guys are talking about the Bible, how it actually talks about all this stuff. So I'm like, I haven't read those parts of the scriptures yet where it talks about a flat earth. Or maybe I just wasn't paying attention to it, I guess. Um, but yeah, very interesting stuff. And there's a lot of times we read things and we don't get it because we're not reading it with a proper lens on it's talking about something and we don't realize it uh, because of perspective. Uh, so um, on the on the eternal torment and that subject, uh, you know, it, when you read the Bible with that thought in mind, you'll be able to spot the verses 
and uh, it'll stand out like a sore thumb where before you didn't get it. Same thing with the flat earth. I, um, there are people who have made lists, a long list of all the verses that support this flat, stationary, dome-covered uh, creation. And uh, when you see all the verses that are used, also not just the, the Bible, but uh, Enoch, first Enoch, of course, is, is very, very descriptive of all this. And I, I think that there's a lot of truth in, in, uh, in uh, some, some argue that, you know, it was in the canon for a while. It still is in the Ethiopian, Ethiopian canon. And uh, we've talked about it before. Uh, I'm not saying it should be in the canon, but uh, now that I've actually listened to it all, uh, it's, it's really blew my mind how it supports the flat earth. But uh, I'm going to have to say um, good night because uh, I'm, I'm really interested in enjoying the conversation. So thank you, everybody. But my body is just giving out on me right now, sitting this long. At it. I hope Friday I can make it for four hours for that endurance thing we're doing Friday. <clears throat> but yeah, my body's giving out right now for sitting too long. So I better uh, say good night to everybody. Well, thank you for your input. And yeah, I was just telling Paula, this one's a late one. We'll have to... Uh call it a night pretty soon ourselves with, with everybody but okay. yeah all right good night, all right brother. Everybody. Uh, enjoyed the, enjoyed the fellowship and discussion with all of you and as i say bless you all in the name of our great savior god jesus good night brother luke god bless good night brother god bless. um so his uh signature sign off is awesome great savior god jesus i remember the first time i heard it uh, it seemed a little awkward to me because it's just you didn't expect it you hadn't you don't hear people say that great savior god and then declares jesus it's awesome i love it um but uh gia and I, I don't know where you stand on the uh, flat earth. Have you uh, looked into it? Do you think it's all crazy talk? Right now it is to me, but I'm going to have an open mind and I'm looking forward to Friday. Just bring your A game, bring all the scriptures. Will you have some kind of PowerPoint kind of like visuals? Cause that would be nice too. Um, um, yeah, we'll have some, some images that, that I'll be able to share. Uh, that was one thing, Estevan, um, if you pay attention to Jason Cripps's icon when he's on on Monday nights, uh, it's the flat earth. It's the Hebrew view of the cosmology. And we will have some to, you know, screen share. But I also have a physical model that will be trying that we'll be able to uh to to show as well but it, it was the scriptures that convinced me uh that the earth was not spinning and that the sun the moon and the stars they were the ones that were moving you know i don't see god speaking to our perspective i see just god speaking truth and it's up to us if we believe it or not and when you get to Joshua, that sun and moon, it was clearly moving. And in Judges, uh, I think it was Judges where the guy, where he asked for a sign for the sundial to move backwards 10 degrees. You know, it wasn't because the earth stopped spinning and turned backwards. The sun moved backwards, it says. Um, okay, well, um, my biggest thing is, um, I just want to hear the other side of why the big conspiracy. I mean, if we're so forward and progressive, why isn't this being discovered or right. exposed? Or, you know, I mean, I know the whole, you know, man in the moon kind of thing, and half the people don't even believe that anyway. So it's not like a big, oh my God, really? The moon didn't happen? So that's not something that's going to shock people. But why the cover up of this? So that has to be convincing just as much as Bible verses. Of course, Bible verses will take precedence, but the whole cover-up conspiracy has to be very convincing to me because right. why, why deny well, it? What's I'll, the point? I, I think I can uh, sum it up for you pretty quickly. Yeah, that was With, good. Uh, I, it boils down 
ultimately to the great deception i believe like i said i actually think the great deception is going to be about a false alien invasion and so nobody would believe aliens if there was not evolution and nobody would ever believe in evolution if there wasn't time and chance and millions of years and nobody would have believed in that unless we weren't the center of God's creation yeah but you see I don't I really don't believe that atheists don't believe because of evolution or because there's no proof for God I I stay strictly with the Bible that God says they do know that God does exist but they because of their sin and and um, the way they wanted to hang on to their sin and the way that they didn't want to um, submit to God or believe in God, that they became, you know, more and more hardened. But right. I no, think ultimately you're, right abso ultimately, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, that, that is exactly it. But that's an excuse. That's an excuse. Oh, we don't, you have to prove that God, that's a, that's, that's an excuse. Oh, you can't prove that God doesn't exist. Therefore, I don't believe that's a, that's a cop out. That's it is. An excuse it it absolutely, it absolutely is. And the reason why we can prove that you're correct is because 600 years ago, 500 plus, um, the whole world believed in a in the biblical earth cosmology what i'm talking about the whole world believed it not just the hebrews but every gentile everybody believed it and still they did not turn to him think about the ones on the boat with jonah when jonah said i'm i'm a hebrew and i worship the god who created the sun the moon the stars the sea all that there is they all knew exactly who he was talking about. Yeah, it's in our DNA. We know. It, correct. It's in our DNA. Yes. Yep. But, um, but the thing is, is they, uh, uh, they knew about him, but they openly, they they didn't turn to him until that point. They actually all repented on that boat, but they did know about him. Um, and so. The, uh, the, just because God's close and everybody did know that he was much closer than billions of billions of light years away, mm -hmm. they still didn't believe unto the saving of the soul. They still didn't rely in the finished work of the coming Messiah, but they knew that the earth or even after Jesus came you know, 700 years ago, it was after, mm -hmm. you know, but they still, they knew that the earth was a closed system, but yet they still didn't come to God or come to Christ. So Who that's the God. point. They, they, before the, the, the globe, they thought it was flat. Exactly. And, right. and they were it's still the all lost. People. That's right. I mean, my father, I mean, I, my father, it, it was astounding drunk atheist and I grew up in Puerto Rico so there were a lot of tremors in the island and every time that tremor will start he will get on his knee and ask for forgiveness and he was like a staunch atheist they all believe I don't buy it they all believe that God really is they just they just want to have this cognizant dissident in their brain right and because they get so much support and they get so much feedback and you know um right. so they have a lot of a, i don't yeah. think that the i don't think that the evolution is the reason why they don't believe that's right but i do think that it, all of this is being set up for the great deception um, see the great deception is going to be something that's going to be so convincing that if it were possible it would deceive the very elect. But the lost are going to be blindsided by it. Uh, and it is... Uh, 
So I agree with you that it's not because of the flat earth or them hiding the flat earth that has made the world go into such apostasy. In fact, I actually think that Satan hid the flat earth and is also in uh, working to reveal it right now. And it's actually going to tie into the whole alien agenda. So um, I think that God's just letting it happen and Satan's doing his thing, but God's going to use it for his glory. Yeah, but, but you see, that could that should have been on the narrative of the end time because he does tell us what's going to happen and all the famine and all the all the difficult thing that's going to happen in the trials and tribulation, but he doesn't mention anything about the shape of the earth. That's not part of the narrative of well, the end wait time. Till Friday. Wait use... till Friday. We'll talk. Okay, you're fine. There I go. <laughs> we'll talk about I'm some. You, think bring it, think bring about um, uh, can I, can even I taking, uh, uh, yeah, in one second, um, uh, taking the literal sense, not spiritualizing, but a literal sense that Every eye will see him when he comes down. Uh, for a globe, the earth, the ball would have to flatten out for no, a single limiting point. Limiting God. No, 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 no. You're limiting God. You can't do that physical thing, and God can't have the whole world look at him. That's no, you, He's not a human being that you can just, well, he just only could, could be seen on, you know, on, on the... You know, the North Pole or the South Pole or only when the sun is, is shining on this side of the, of the globe. I, I don't think no, that's no, I, I, I'm, I'm with I, I'm with you because I didn't always believe in the flat earth when I believed that every eye would see him. But I'm saying that when you take the heavens rolled back as a scroll, you can take that figuratively and an, an, as an analogy or you could take it literally. And so if you. If you have a ball perspective, it would have to be an analogy. Right. But if you have the disc perspective, it can certainly be literal. So, okay, um, bring it. That's, <laughs> I'm gonna have an open mind. Um, you know, but yeah, okay. I look forward to Friday. Right. Yeah. There's uh, and there'll be there'll there's plenty of verses that will be brought up. I I have a list of. And I need to find it and I'll send it to you. But when I was doing research, I had a, it started with 90, right, 98. And I wanted to get to 100. And then I uh, ended up have, finally stopping at like 107. But now I have a friend who has 130 verses. So they found more. But there's a bunch of them. Um, thinking about how much... The Bible talks about the moon giving off her own light. Totally opposite of what geo or what the heliocentric model says, and that the moon reflects the light of the sun. That's not what the Bible says. All right. I'll save it for Friday. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, that'll be fun. All right. So, so You're sorry, Esteban. Me. I need to uh, write it down, check things out. Uh, you. Yeah, do send me that list so I can kind of don't get so overwhelmed um, when you guys want to throw it all at once. Right, I'm right. Sure I have a panel. So. so you actually have it written down already and you don't have to transcribe it. No, I exactly. understand. Um, and I will. I'll shoot it to you. Esteban, what were you saying? Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I'll send it no, to it's... you as well, Will. Um, it's no problem. Um so that deception, yeah, actually, um, they, they, they found in the, the Samaritan tablets um, where it talks about how these gods created us and all this stuff. So people already see that, and then they're trying to say that it's older than the Bible, it predates the Bible. They're trying to say all these things. And um, so that deception is there. And I've seen UFOs very close up. And I'll tell you right now, my mouth dropped. I had no word. I was lost for words. I couldn't say anything. Uh, it was actually fearful. I, I, uh, I was a kid when I saw it, so it, it kind of freaked me out. I didn't know what the heck to think of it. Um, so from saying all that, 
Um, there is a big deception on this, and they're they're gonna. Oh man, there's I've I've heard so many um, things back then too before I came to the scriptures about aliens because I was really indulged into that kind of stuff, and I can go more in depth with that because I. And then I found out that they're actually demons and fallen angels and stuff. But I found out the truth. That was one step in the in, in my direction of seeking out truth and stuff. Um, but before all that happened, I can tell you that I read a lot of books on aliens and a lot of different things. And then when I compared it to the scriptures, it made more and more sense that they were actually fallen angels and demons and stuff because of the way they looked and the character character uh characters i can't say it right uh characteristics i should say i guess of them um we're going back to the bible and it was uh it's something scary i I wouldn't i wouldn't want to be around those uh those things because um i kind of think that it would it would freak a lot of people out because it tells us in the bible too that man's hearts will fail them for what they see what's coming on the earth um and it's true. Uh, I mean, you're going to also see probably the, uh, well, at least they, I think maybe you would see them, the um, blue hair, the blonde haired, blue eyed, um, they call them aliens or whatever. Um, I think they're the ones that are going to bring this uh, false peace and safety or they're already doing it behind the scenes and we're not even really seeing that right now. Um, and you know, we, we don't know. I I mean, I, at least I don't know. Um, but I've heard some ideas about that. What do you guys think of that? Well, I, I think that the alien agenda has been being pushed for decades and that they are going to, uh, use it. That's one of the reasons why I think it's the, uh, the great deception. And yes, we, uh, We've actually had a broadcast on this long ago on the Great Deception and how I, how a lot of us think that it's going to be uh, fake. I have to put in fake. Fake alien invasion. Like I said, they're extra dimensional, not extraterrestrial. Uh, and Gia also... Autumn has been putting in a few of those verses uh, in the chat room about the different lights. Um, and all uh, they're all included in that list that I'll send to you and Lil. Uh, but another thing that um, can be tested, if you have a digital thermometer, if you use the digital thermometer and check the degrees the temperature um in the sunlight and then in the in a shadow the temperature in the sunlight is hotter than in the shadow that's common sense of course right but if you do it with the moonlight the moonlight is actually colder than the shadow at night So, the moon gives off not the yellow light, but a blue light. Totally different light. Totally different light spectrum. And temperature-wise, when you're standing in the moonlight, it's actually colder than if you're standing in the shade from the moon. You know, like if you're standing behind a wall that gives, uh, gives shade from the moonlight... You're mm-hmm. actually warmer there. So, um, just that's a scientific test that many of us have done when we found that out. We had to check it out for ourselves. How but, sh- I'm not sure how that correlates to the moon, sh- the, to the earth shape. Uh, well, it correlates to saying that uh, the moonlight does not reflect, uh, is not, is not the is not a reflection of sunlight. So it doesn't necessarily talk about the shape of the earth, but it talks about how the moon is not some reflective organism or, or uh, 
into uh, whatever reflective mass mm -hmm. <clears throat> um it's actually a mass that perpetrates its own light mm -hmm. even a different light spectrum that gives off cold light rather than hot light like this the sun gives off hot light the moon gives off cold light okay not big on science so i'm not sure i can't right i, I can't make that right that would take um getting a uh, uh like i said a digital thermometer uh -huh. um and just spending some time in the sunlight and the moonlight uh it's best if you do it in a full moon but you could do it in uh as long as you've got moonlight you can you can uh test and see the difference in the temperature so it's uh it's it's quite shocking but like i said we'll we'll come with uh verses and um and different testimonies different things that have uh made us and, and then there's the metaphor versus versus literal <laughs> that's gonna be a little tough it it will be, but uh, there's very few metaphors in the Bible. Mm, I don't know. There's very few. I would say that... Uh, I mean, the Lord is the Lamb. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the light. He's the door. He's the shepherd. I don't he's know if sheep. I can call those metaphors. Those are metaphors. He's not literally a sheep. He's not literally a door. He's not literally a way. He well, doesn't no, have no, black he, of fire coming out of his eyes. He's does they all metaphors. They're all expressing uh, an attribute. Oh, we'll have to talk about that more. I would say he is literally the way and literally the door. Like I I I don't think that just because you can spiritualize it. Door. Right, right. That's what I was saying. Just because you can spiritualize it doesn't mean that it's not literal. Um, there's a term that I used to use a lot, but people made fun of me because they're like, that's an oxymoron. So don't use it often, but spiritually literal, <laughs> it should be a word because just because it's spiritual doesn't mean that it's not literal. So yeah, there's only one door to eternal life. Now, Jesus is not some like door that you carve out of wood. Right. But if we're talking right. about an opening in which all other ways are blocked, except for through this doorway, well, Jesus is that, literally. So just because you can spiritualize it, I don't necessarily think that it's a metaphor. You, you get what I'm saying? Like, I don't go as far as saying, oh, Jesus is the door and then trying to make it a physical door. I mean, you're expressing a truth, but it's Correct. not a little. Well, I would say I would say that it is like there is no other way but Jesus. Right. In that sense. But, you know. So, I mean. <laughs> Hey, that's not hey, a third option. It's whether it's literal or it's metaphor. I don't know. A third option it would be spiritualize it. I mean, I don't. Possibly, if we would have to look into that. Possibly, maybe spiritualize. Right, exactly. If if we and uh, and if if we see that things are more spiritual than metaphorical, which just because it's spiritual doesn't mean that it doesn't it can't be metaphorical. So it doesn't totally negate it. But if you went through and saw, uh, if you really grasped what I was saying, and I'm not saying you have to, about the spiritual literal, like you can spiritualize it, but that's literal. That's not a metaphor. That's 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 actual matter of fact, you know. Um, I said, yes. Then you would see why I say that it's little metaphorical. You know, there's metaphors in it. Love your expressions, you know, decisionism, you know. <laughs> right. Doing my theorism, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, I, I hear you. I've got my own. Uh, uh, yeah, I know. I noticed that. Decisionism, though. Um, 
on that, uh, I heard um, Paul Walker using that word decisionism, and he was against it, and he said it was only uh, regeneration. Paul Paul Washer, you mean Calvinism yeah, Paul guy? Washer. Yeah. Right. Um, see, that's what stinks about this. Calvinism and decisionism are two sides of the ditch that are so close to the truth um, that they try to, you know, uh, talk about the flaws of the other side and the pros to their own side. But yet both of them are neglecting the absolute truth. If, Because here's the thing. If you think that there is volition at the moment of salvation in order to get it, like you get a chance to reject it after God reveals it. If you think there's volition at the moment of salvation, that's decisionism and it's a workspace gospel. But if you think that there is no volition at all, that free will is not involved in the election process, may, may then ask, that's what's Calvinism. Volition? What's that? What's volition? To be able to make a decision. Because I thought we made choices in our life to either believe or not to believe. You make all sorts of choices in your... Well, well you don't make any choice to believe. Yeah. But choice but choice and decision are two different meanings. There's two different meanings of the word. Did you make a decision to believe that your icon is made out of red and black? Did you make a decision to believe that? No, it's just there. But but it is red and black. You believe that, right? Well, yeah. I mean, it's okay, shown by okay. evidence. So, so you do believe it. Did you make a decision to believe it? No, because the evidence was proof enough. There you go. The evidence. That's a, If you have to decide to believe it, it's not true belief. There's your point. You just hit the nail on the head. Well, I mean, I already knew that. It's common sense. It's not common sense. This is what's keeping most people out of heaven. No, like when I read the scripture, it was proof because of what he said. Correct, but you don't make a decision to believe I, when, no, the I'm evidence, not, I'm not, when the I'm evidence not saying, is what persuades you. Yeah, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying like I thought there was a difference between choice and decision. Not really. You have so? choices and you can make a choice or make a decision of the choices. But see, if if see, there's all sorts. You you said it right. You make all sorts of decisions all, all along the way as you're seeking God. If you're going to remain seeking, if you're going to keep digging for that treasure, if you're going to accept the truth that He's revealed to you, there's a lot of volition along the way. But if somebody truly wants to know God, they'll keep going, and at some point. On God's timing, not man's, on God's timing and his alone, he will give the understanding to the person. Open their eyes so that they can see, open their ears so that they can hear, and that they can understand with their heart. And at that moment, they believe, they're believers. It's a work of God for them to be able to believe in such a manner. There was no volition in them in God doing that work at that moment. It was God's timing, his choice, his work. But he but only the, does it, he only does that for people who are humbly, honestly seeking. If somebody would reject him, he wouldn't even reveal himself to him. God's omniscient. What's that? But if they're rejecting him, then they they chose to reject him because right. they got they had all the Correct. evidence but, right there in front of them. Right, but they chose to reject him while they were seeking. They they that was where volition. That wasn't at the moment of salvation. God didn't reveal. They were rejecting him the whole time, so God never reveals himself to them. Yes, they they were they were choosing to not respond to God drawing. So he never he never reveals himself to him. But what some but, people will say is that when God reveals himself to people, 
that you have to have a choice to either accept him or reject him after he reveals himself. That is decisionism, and that's a false gospel that's leading people to hell. But if they can choose to reject him, how can they not choose to receive to receive him? You see, you got to think about it like this. Okay, you're, in a you're question putting form, it, though. You're, you're, you're putting your volition at the wrong place. Remember, there's two different things here. There's a time where you put on the yoke and you learn of him. That's volition the whole way. And then there's the moment of salvation. Two totally different things. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's volition to seek. There's volition to keep digging. But at the moment of salvation, when God does the revealing himself, there's no volition at all. Man did not cause it to happen. The timing, the place, the way, the how. None of it. It was all God. To say man had any volition at that point is the most hidden works-based gospel there is. Can I say something yeah. real quick? Yeah. Um, this is really, really interesting. But I think I have, I kind of agree with you, Matthias. And you kind of making Calvinist point a little bit, but hear me out. Okay. Because you're right. At the moment of salvation, it's supernatural and it's so irresistible. It's almost like you didn't even know what hit you. That's how it happened with me. I was seeking but I wasn't sure I was seeking him because I didn't read the Bible. I didn't, I was totally in the world. So when I, when I started seeking spiritual things and it kind of like, it started drawing me, well, it's a lot of things that happened, but at the moment of salvation, you're not thinking, well, if it's a decision, did I say believe or trust? Did I do it this way? No, this is decisionism. I, none of that happens. Because at the moment that you, the way I did it, I, I asked, I asked God, God reveal yourself to me like a week before. And then it's boom, 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 boom. Until the, the moment I said, yes, it was almost like after that, it was out of my control. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I mean, <clears throat> the fact that you wanted to know him is the reason why he revealed himself. That's yep, where the volition he even was. Did that. He even did that. He actually gave me that desire. I don't. That's what I'm saying. I'm on the fence when it comes to that. Yes, I believe that God gives opportunity for everybody. I don't believe He just chooses a few and then send the rest to hell. Well, but would, it's something right. about how He even puts that desire. Right. We'll see what you're because, what you're talking about, and I get exactly what you're saying. You're mm -hmm. talking about the drawing. He's He's not willing that any would perish. And that if he was lifted up, speaking of on the cross, he would draw all men unto himself. So, yeah, it was like know, a wooing. Yes, yes, yes. So, it was. With, and, and nobody would seek after God without him seeking us first. You know, mm -hmm. so it is him drawing all people. But the thing is, is, is it humility or pride that he's met with? If he's met with humility, he will give grace and more understanding. If he's met with pride, God will actively resist them. But he can even tear that down because I think we all prideful to a certain well, extent. Can I? Can I? Can I also say something real you quick? You are too? right. Yeah, you can. One second. You are right. God, every that you're absolutely right. Pride is what's keeping everybody from going to God and God does break a lot of people down to where they go on their back and all they can do is look is up do is look up but still many of them stay too prideful and they land in unbelief uh religion tradition uh and works so, yeah I think that it's not so much pride also it's also fear because like in my background I always equated God with religion and rules and this and that so I have to he had to kind of break through that. But it was a lot of it was fear because I was like, what am I, what am I going to give up? Am I going to give up my fun? I'm going to give up my sin. What am I supposed to give up? Because when I got saved, a lot of people demanded that I prove that I was saved. I came from a holiness Pentecostal church. I can write a whole book on that. So, so it was a lot of demand on me. You know, are you truly saved? Are you truly, it's not like I didn't change. I changed radically, 
but it was so much demand because of the background that I came from. Now, if I would if I would have been in a non-denominational, it would probably have been easier. But they were like, okay, you got to speak in tongues. You got to get baptized. My mother wanted me to put on a fast and prayer. My mother was like a Pentecostal holiness, swinging off the chandelier. So I had to unlearn a lot of things. It was a big story, but but you're right. It's it's a lot of baggages in a lot of that you bring and God has to cut through it in a lot of different ways. That's why everybody gets saved a little bit different based on what you brought to the table, you know, not just Amen. pride. Amen. All right, go ahead, Espen. Sorry. Yeah, it's fine. Um, yeah, I hear what you're saying, Matthias. Like, um, when you, like when you're seeking and stuff like that and, and you're, and you're seeking after his face, you're seeking after all that thing. And he, and he sees in your heart, you're humbled. Um, but, like for me, um, you know, I was seeking him, but I knew he had to break me first. So what did he do? I ended up going into a false religion first. And what did that do? That broke the heck out of me because I started to realize it was hardening my heart. Like, uh, how do I explain it? I was in the whole Hebrew roots thing and I was telling people, you can't eat this, you can't eat that. How dare you say that about me? Or how dare you say that about him? Uh, it was being mean. It wasn't being like nice and loving and all that. Um, the more and more I look back at it, I'm like, Ugh, how did I even like, why was I like that? I should have been more kind to people. Right. Well, that was, that's talking about the religion tradition uh, that, that Satan uses to distract people. Um I wouldn't say that God necessarily put you there to break you. Uh, I would say that God was working on you while you were in there trying to pull you out of there. <laughs> um, but yeah. uh, I do, this is a good time to explain what humble means. Uh, humbling yourself as a work is what Preach Christ LA um, said. And if you try to define humble as the world describes it, then... Yes, if you're talking about like this meek and lowly person, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be this humble person. No, that's that's not biblical humility. Biblical humility is under is realizing that you are wrong and that God is right, and it's humiliating, humble, humiliating, to realize you are wrong about everything that you thought was true. That's humiliating. Yeah, that's what and I was trying. And to humble trying. yourself is to say, uh, to humble yourself is to say, God, I'm right, or God, I'm wrong, and you are right. And you get in the word, and you believe it more than you believe yourself. That's getting the crumbs off the table from the master when from the master's table when the crumbs fall. Um. So, uh, when, um, I mean, of course I'm wrong on a lot of things and there's still a lot of things I don't really know. And that's just called being ignorant. Um, like, I don't know about this whole flat earth. I mean, I'm kind of okay with it and I'm kind of not. I'm like, well, well I don't know. Well, right. I'm, real quick. I mean, what's going on with liberally conservative? Why is he getting all frustrated? I didn't realize, uh. He was in the drama tonight. There's a lot of drama tonight, guys, and I'm not exactly sure why. I guess it's been a little entertaining, but I haven't been able to even look at it, let alone really address it. But uh, it's nice having new people in the chat. I, I'm glad to have it. It stinks that there seems to be a lot more strife tonight. Uh, than we've had in two years on air, but um, not sure what's going on. Uh, but I'll have to do a little bit of uh, research into it. But at the same time, uh, I'll go ahead and apologize for not being able to be on top of it myself. Um, I wanted to ask you too, though. Um, so when you talk about decisionism and all that. Um, does that mean that God chooses who's going to go to heaven and who's going to go to hell, like the Calvinistic belief system? No, not at all. No. That's where I get confused. I'm like, what <laughs> no. are... No. 
think it's okay. Think like I the the explanation can, I, can I, I say gave something you. Real quick, can I say something? Yeah, real quick? yeah, go ahead. Just can, um, can you? What is your name? Um, not Matthias, but yeah. What is uh, your uh, name? Esteban. Uh, Esteban, Esteban Martinez. Esteban Martinez. Yeah. Yeah, I'm Martinez too. Um, oh, okay, awesome. so can you just? I'm I'm just curious. What was your point of salvation? What was that like? Because I mean, you are sure that you're safe now, right? Yes, I'm sure. I'm I'm dead sure because I know I, I know that it was only Christ that died for my sins. I can't do anything to go to heaven at all. I mean, um, I'm not good. I I suck. Okay, yeah, we all suck. I guess, I know. <laughs> uh, okay, so so you're wondering whether you're wondering whether is is Calvinistic the way he chose? Is that what you're saying? Is, I was is, just asking. Uh, the reason I was just asking him that because, like, I'm trying to understand where he's coming from on this. Because, like, I've heard because I've been in the Calvinistic um, churches and stuff like that. I've been in one. And they, they told me I can never choose. And if I'm the elect, I'm the elect. And they used to tell me that all the time. And I used to freaking hate them for it because it made me, it made me hate myself even more because I'm like, well, then if I'm going to hell, why in the heck do I need to even worry about this? And yeah, I, I they really it. screwed up my mind. I mean, that's why I'm worried about this because I just want to know where he, where he stands on this. Right. Well, the, uh, okay. So what I'm trying do you believe two plus two is four yes because of doing the mathematics for it right it, okay if you went to common core and you didn't have such evidence of your entire life proving to you that two plus two is four Somebody might be able to convince you or make you believe that 2 plus 2 can equal whatever you want it to. We actually have kids who actually believe that. So believing 2 plus 2 is 4, what you would possibly call fact, is actually what you believe. And you don't make decisions to believe anything in life. So... <laughs> Where does the volition come in? Do you think of it this way? If you, you've heard of a treasure on an island that, that's free if, for you if you just go and find it, your volition would be to get up, go to that f island, and then start digging for it. And your volition would be, I haven't found it yet. I'm going to keep digging or I'm going to stop digging. And that could go on for a long time. But then there'll come a time to where you find that treasure. It wasn't, you didn't decide to find the treasure. You just found it. You decided to go looking for it. And when you find the treasure, you don't sit there and go, hmm, now do I want to keep this treasure or do I want to get rid of this treasure? If you were ever going to get rid of the treasure, you would have stopped looking for it before you found it. But if your, your choice to go searching for it and to remain searching for it is where your volition is, the moment you found it, that wasn't even up to you. Does that make sense? The moment you found it is when you actually believe it. That's not that up make, to you. That but it's up sense. to you to go and research and learn of Jesus said, put on the yoke and learn of me. That's where your volition is. Are you going to learn of this person? He says, trust. How are you going to trust him if you don't know him? That's the volition. Are you going to take the time to get to know him? And if you do, if you seek him, God promised everyone who seeks him will find him. But you finding him is not up to you. That's up to him. And he promised everyone who seeks him will find him. It's up to him. You'll find him if you seek for him. Do you trust that? Accept it? Move forward. 
I mean, yes. Um, and, and another point, too, is then how much do you have to seek him? in order for you to accept it i mean well you just do you, to... do, you do you it doesn't get into how you don't have a parameter uh think about something in life that you wanted that you really wanted how much I, did I you really realize? want how, how much I how want, much did you seek it i wanted him <laughs> growing up i needed that peace i was literally going through a lot of stuff growing up. So like, it, it was like, closer. I mean, if you don't mind me saying this, Matthias, like, you know, at the age of like 12, uh, growing up, I wanted that. I wanted that peace. I wanted that peace that surpassed everything. I went through so much pain, so much mental stuff that it literally damaged me growing up. I, I literally grew up damaged because of the stuff I went through. Of course I wanted that piece. I mean, to be honest with you, I, like watching the, the Passion of the Christ, that was, I literally, I, I'm going to be straight up forward. I cried. No, so did everybody. My wife did too, and she was a God hater. And, but no, but it wasn't about being hate. I didn't, ever, I didn't hate him. Well, no, she did. My wife, oh. Paula, hated God at the time when she watched the, the... She was shocked that she was even going to watch this movie. But when wow. she watched it, she cried. I, I mean, for me... And didn't make me, her a believer. Oh, she was well, still I'm a God-hater saying, for I'm, a long time after that. Yeah, well, I mean, for me, it was a different thing. And I and I kind of looked at it like, oh, he, he humbled himself for me. He died for me. Why do I want to throw that away? It made me question myself growing up. Why would I want to throw away something that he did for me? I wouldn't want to do that. I'm not righteous. I'm not anybody. He's the righteous one. Right. But it's and, and I, but the thing is, is, I was, look, I literally was a loner growing up. I literally got spit at. I literally got smacked around growing up as a kid in high school. I had bullies that you, you don't even, like some of the things that they did to me, you and you would, I mean, people joined in and I still walked away from them. I wanted to hit them, but something inside me said, don't do it. I grew up in high school like that. And I'm not saying I'm, I'm not boasting about myself. I'm boasting about him because you know what? I kept thinking Christ. Why would I want to do, why would I want to do something to him? I'm supposed to show love to these people. And, and people say, oh, you can't, you can't believe when you're in high school. You can't believe when you're a kid. I say, forget that because you know what? I was a believer. Oh yeah. You probably most get, every kid's a believer. Every kid is close to God and believes in God. Of course, but n none of them are saved. They're safe. They're all going to go to heaven if they die. Even if they die in unbelief because they, they were born into an atheist home. But uh, you've got to... I don't know when the, exactly the age of accountability is, but every child is a believer. Doesn't mean they're saved. I was a believer. You know, I wanted to know God. I was an altar boy doing genreflex and wanting to be all spiritual because I wanted to but, have a close relationship with God. Yeah, but in, in high school, I never went to church. Okay, right, so I let guess. me let me ask you something, Esteban. That means that you were a Hebrew rooter before you became saved. Wait, say that one more time. Well, were you well, a Hebrew? You were a Torah observant? I thought you said something about Torah. Or was yeah, that after you got saved? That was before well, you got saved. Yeah. I, I, I wonder literally, why people want to get into that before they're saved. I mean, before well, you're saved, no, it you don't care about none of that. I mean, it wasn't. It, what, what happened was, um, Matthias, that, that, what was that? Um, the people that used to interview a lot um, back at D13 and stuff. Um, now you see TV. 
Yes. Uh, I started watching their stuff. And I got hooked in by all these... They were talking about, like, the dif- different deceptions and all these other s- topics and stuff. I got hooked up on that. And then they started talking about how they were Torah observants. And I was like, What's a, what the heck's a Torah observant? Um, and then got into the whole thing. It just it was like a hook, line, and sinker thing. Um, were you around whenever it, whenever I finally, when everything blew up and I called Pounders out for his false gospel? No, I didn't get to watch. You had a video on that? Yeah, he even put up a video like, this is the, this is what I believe. And his gospel was works. Oh, and I called shit. him out on it. What video was that? Because I don't know if I even saw that. Well, that one was a Facebook video. Um, but, oh. y- yeah, the uh, we got a little too close with them, and I take blame in it. But while I've heard of a few people, like what you're saying, got sucked into it, I know a lot of people who, uh, because we were so close with Now You See TV, and they were stuck in the Hebrew roots. Who was this? Who was this? These were, uh, this would be people that, uh, this was back three, four years ago whenever I started doing internet ministry. Um, I got pretty close with uh, with some Hebrew rooters and didn't really put the difference between the gospel and what they believed. And we were close friends for a while. But then it came down to where, like, I had a couple, I had several people come to me like they were confused because I'm preaching grace. But then they keep hearing from Pounders and uh, Hall uh, a different story. And so they're like, but you guys are, you guys are friends. You guys are, but you're saying different things. I'm like, yes, we are saying different things. So when, uh, when it all came to light, there was a big blow up and, uh, um, apparently, but you know, I actually heard recently that they have put out videos apologizing for being deceivers. You're not talking about Philly, are you? Talking about who? Philly Ministries? No, talking about Now You See TV. Now You See, so, you never heard of them. So wait, they have an actual video out now? They I, have their I don't sorry know. I, for I can't say. I don't know. I heard that. I heard that they, that they recanted on some doctrines that they said that were damnable. I hope it's the Hebrew roots, but I can't even... I can't even... Uh, uh, confirm if they have done that but yeah um gee a lot of people before they get saved get sucked into i'm gonna do the law and i'm gonna do the feasts and like uh, i mean i don't know too many saved people who who follow the feasts uh regularly i know a couple but most of the time it's people who are just I'm going to do what I can for God. And they get sucked in the Hebrew roots. I, I couldn't you know? sleep at night thinking that I have to do all these feasts and Sabbath and moons and days. I, I will be like exhausted. I, I t- couldn't do it. I'll tell you right now. They shake yeah. their boots. That's for sure. What's that? I could tell you right now, <laughs> trying to do all that, it, 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 I was an utter failure. I mean, like, I, I couldn't sleep at night. I was always worried, am I saved? Am I not saved? Am I, where am I going to go when I die? Am I, you know, and to be honest with you, like, the only, I think he was calling out to me because I kept feeling this, this pressure. I mean, like, it, I don't know if you guys ever felt like um, when you're, when you don't think you're, like, good enough, you have, like, this weight pushing down on your shoulders and it feels like it's quicksand and it's going you're going down and you can't breathe and you're trying to get up to grasp for that air but that's a body attack (laughs) every time every every time when you try to come up it just keeps pushing you further and further down and finally you have the savior come to get you and he pulls you out 
you see, that was me. I was going down that quicksand and I wasn't under, I, I was like, why am I feeling this pressure? I don't get it. And finally, I started, I read, the first verse that got me was Romans 10.4. That verse got me. <laughs> for, Christ is, uh, for Christ is the end of the law to them that believe. Um, pr I'm paraphrasing that. I don't know if that's exactly how it says it, but um, but that Romans 10.4 got me. And then reading, you know, Romans 3.23, for none are righteous. And then you have the uh, Romans 6.23, you know, um, I can't think of all the, the verses. I just know the, the numbers of the verses and stuff right now on the top of my head. But the more I started reading into it, like the New Testament, because I was kind of reading the Old Testament, and I got halfway through it, um, and I kept going, yeah, the Ten Commandments, but there's, there's 613. I'm like, I'm so foolish for even thinking only Ten Commandments are going to be okay, and that I have to keep a Sabbath day law. I have to... When, when Christ is our rest, I'm like, what the heck was wrong with me back then? Um, but I started going back to these old channels that I was watching. And, and when would somebody would say, oh, yeah, you need to rest on the seventh day, which is Saturday. I would say, oh, no, you're wrong. Jesus Christ is our rest. I said, how can you, how can you say that they need to rest a certain day? You're putting a law on them. Stop doing that. And they, the guy got mad at me and kicked me off because I kept telling him it was only Christ. I kept telling the whole chat uh, when I would go to these uh, places I used to, you know, listen to and stuff. I used to tell a lot of the guys that were in the chat rooms, hey, don't believe what he's saying because Christ, I know nothing but Christ. And I would tell them that he would, get, he would give them the hope that they need, not the law. The law is going to just condemn you more and more and more and make you suffer. But you may not feel it right now, but I'll tell you right now, it's make, it will make you feel... Like you can't do it eventually. And when you have that epiphany, that's when, you, you know, God's calling you even more, trying to get you out of it. Um, yeah. That's beautiful, man. I mean, right. the um, more you forget, the oh. more you go through, the more you love, the more you can believe your, your trust goes a hundred percent tenfold than people who don't go through a lot. Yeah, they take it for granted, and they're like the older brother and the prodigal son, you know? They get mad when the black sheep of the family gets all the love from God. And, I mean, that's that's where you are. I mean, that's who you are. You came from a lot, so you love a lot. You trust a lot now. All right. No, amen. The closer you get to him, the closer he gets to you. Draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to you. Um, with, uh, with kids being close to God, now, I get it that if a kid is a abhorring God and a God hater, what it is, is they're believing their parents, uh, and they've gotten past what I'm talking about as a little kid, um, I'm talking about like toddler age. I think that they can see into the second heaven even. I'm not sure that the veil is fully over their eyes. Uh, if anybody has had young children and seen them be attentive uh, to something in the room that's not f visible, uh, you know what I'm talking about. But then also, I think that when... Uh, kids are close to God, even if they are God haters and they're in their adolescence, the fact that the intuition of a child is much stronger and greater and connected to God, um, even if they're God haters, they have an intuition that uh, keeps them safe a lot of times. So, uh, I get that people may be God haters, but when I meant close to God, I meant that he's speaking to them, uh, intuitively way more to children than he is to adults who are actively rejecting him. Um, but, uh, George, it's good to see you. Welcome. 
Uh, um, I, I would have to say, yeah, Matthias. I mean, my mom used to tell me when I was a kid that I was talking to angels. And, um, I mean, I would stand at a corner of the room in my bedroom and literally be just talking to the corner of the room. And she would come in and say, who are you talking to? I keep hearing you talking to these people or whatever the heck they are. I don't know what they are. And I'm like, Mom, they're, they're angels. She's like, what? You're, you're talking to what? I'm like, I'm talking to angels. And I was like four years old, she told me when I told her that. <laughs> um, and growing up, yeah, I was able to see things that it would freak the heck out of me. I'd wake up in a cold sweat at night. Like, it... It was scary. Um, and sometimes I still have dreams of these things. Uh, and I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. It just sucks. <laughs> um, I don't know if you guys have had any experiences like that. Right. Um... Well, my mother was like a good witch. Because we had like a lot of voodoo where I came right. from, come from. I was about to say, because I She was actually... like a spiritist. And uh, I used to see some crazy stuff in the house too. And my father was an atheist. So they were, my mother was a Catholic and a witch. So she had like right. statues of Mary. Right. Four feet high. Thing. Smack went... in the middle of the living room. I went it through was... the same thing. She would be getting having science and having people gather around the table and trying to call the dead and stuff like that. It was some mess. Ugh, I couldn't wait to get out of there. Right. No, I went through the same thing uh, with my mom being Catholic. In fact, you know, kids, ha the reason why I think they're closer to God intuitively is because they're, I think that they are connected spiritually like that veil. So, you know, uh, I think that I was actually playing with devils. I actually had a uh, imaginary friend that I named Geo. And I can look back, and what happened was, you know how you get pictures, uh, picture frames, and when you buy a picture frame, it has this image of a picture in it. Well... People would say I had an over imagination, over uh, active imagination, because the picture was actually interacting with me, and I then he then was not just in the picture. I would interact with him as you know the same kid from the picture, but playing in my room. And I remember my parents. Uh, or me realizing they couldn't see him and I'm like what this is crazy how do they not see you and he was just as real as real could be to me uh, at three and four years old and uh, I uh, he, he I don't know if I named him Geo or if he told me his name was Geo but looking back now, knowing what I know, and especially being with all the crucifixes and all the statues and all the uh, Catholic paraphernalia that was in the house, I was definitely dealing with spiritual wickedness and devils. So, you know, I, I know that I was when I was a kid. I can even look back and think some of the stuff I did because of the thoughts that came into my head was spiritual wickedness. I almost burned, <laughs> burned my house down uh, like an idiot. I had this thought in my head, pour some gasoline on the fire. Like me and my 12-year-old friend were sitting there playing with fire like an, like idiots anyways. But <laughs> this, uh, ah, I, knew th I knew that if you put gasoline on a fire that the fire would go up it. But this voice in my head just said, do it. I just did it. I, I remember clearly. Oh, pour it on there. That'd be cool. Okie dokie. And I did it. And uh, Praise God I didn't burn the house down. But um, practically my backyard I did. <laughs> um. So can I ask you this then too? Because it's bringing back memories. Um, like in high school, I guess you could say, when I moved from Tucson and everything. Um. <sighs> 
at the age of like 16, 17, I would, because I moved into a new house and everything, I would see this old man. Um, I felt like I was out of my body uh, in these experiences. But anyway, um, I was taking psychedelics and stuff. Bad idea. Um, I kept seeing this dark shadowy figure, but I can make out that he had like suspenders on. And uh, he his arm length, I mean, they surpassed his kneecaps. I mean, they would go all the way down to almost his feet. His 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 arms were basically dragging on the floor, uh, and he would sit in a couch, and he would have this really weird grin, and his mouth would open so wide, like it could fit a baby in there. It was creepy. Um, and he used to say, "Hey boy, hey boy," and it would just freak me out and get it louder and louder, and I'm trying to get back to my body, freaking out. And I didn't know how to. And it's like he was trying to get into my body. It was a weird situation uh, back then. Uh, would you say that's a demonic attack? I mean, it sounds like one to me. Right. I think you answered it. But just because we go through, just because our past included spiritual wickedness doesn't mean anything. And in fact, it gives us the ability to fight against it in the in the war today but yeah it sounds like you were going through the same type of stuff i was going through but if if your mom and family were like gia's and my i mean my mom wasn't a witch but she's still catholic to this day they still have all that catholic junk up all on their walls she's still dealing with the same devils today but uh but yeah that's i would say that that would be um something that we were all going through sorry gia go ahead yeah but greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world you know now it's like we have this armor we're completely protected i don't believe in that christians can be demon possessed or or anything of that sort i think yeah that's a lie from from the yeah, devil so like I, if you listen to the broadcast i had with that guy noah recently we didn't bring it up but he and his ministry i'm putting up quotation marks here um his ministry oh you is... threw the dig i heard the dig i heard the dig uh, <laughs> lord lord didn't i prophesy didn't i cast out demon oh yeah you threw it out there <laughs> yeah, yeah okay all right yes <laughs> that's funny because i was wondering if he picked up on it but yes i threw that's it. that's why that... he wanted to interrupt you right away because that's like his thing you know yeah yeah, that was okay. So yeah, exactly. You know, you, you know what's up there. Uh, I don't believe in that at all. There's no evidence in scripture. In fact, the evidence in scripture says the exact opposite: that darkness dissolves in light, and in the name of Jesus, everything must flee. Must. There is no. There is no fire. Fire. <laughs> it sounds like oh, Beavis and Butthead. Gosh. You know, like, fire! Fire! <laughs> 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 uh, but, um, yeah, actually, I can tell you right now, like, since I've been saved, um, uh, whenever some, like, even in my deep sleep, because, like, I've had people try to wake me up, and they're saying, why are you saying Jesus rebuke you? Jesus rebuke you over and over and over again while you're sleeping. Um, they would ask me that the next morning. They can hear me in the hallway. Like, they can hear me from my room in the hallway, I guess. Um, and I'm constantly saying, Jesus rebuke you. And they're, they're freaking out going, what, what's going on? And, like, they would say that the door would start moving and closing and stuff because, I guess, something was getting angry. I don't know. But, um... I've had that happen a few times and then now it's just calmed down so much that they're like, oh, now it's at peace. Nobody has to worry anymore in the household, they said. I was like, oh, that's awesome. I just, I didn't know I was saying that in my sleep. Thank you for telling me. No, that's, that's cool. Well, that's look, guys, it's getting a little late, so I think I'm going to call it a night. Yes. It's been great <laughs> well no it was great having you on uh 
we're gonna call it a night really we're at uh, three and a half hours almost which is great um it was a good broadcast it was mm-hmm. these chat room fishing are fun um and gia uh you found the private fellowship right no, that's what I wanted to get into, but then all of a sudden I'm on this chat, on this panel, but I'm like, oh, wait a minute, I guess that's not what I was meaning to do, but <laughs> no, I don't know how to do that. You've got to have to... Um, I, did you, I sent you an email yesterday, I think, that gives the link to, it's a go to meetings. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So okay. the like password the is in thing. there. So what you'll do is just click the link to join the meeting and you may have to download the app to your iPad or your even computer or phone. But once you have the program, um, it's basically video, audio, and text chat. So it's a room where we can have up to a thousand people or no, up to a hundred people, a hundred people. Okay. Um, so we've never come that close. I think the most has been like a dozen at the time. So it really is just open all the time. You just go in there. Um, there is a uh, uh, um, uh, Google Hangouts chat box. Mm-hmm. And somebody will add you to it that basically if they're going in there, they say, hey, I'm going into the in the fellowship room and if somebody can join they'll they'll jump in there you know um so what's the name of the app okay it's on the email it's on the email right it should it should get you there and if anybody else wants to join the private fellowship just email me and tell me that's what you want and i will respond with the information which will give you a link that you can join by computer Mm -hmm. Or you can actually even call in with the telephone. You don't have to use the internet. Um, But you do have to use the password. So look in the email. There's a password Mm -hmm. um, to be able to get in. It's right there. Uh, Just try. And as long as we don't get trolls in there, then we don't have to uh, change the link. It'll stay the same. It stays the same every day. So just go to that email and uh, if we have to we can change the rooms if for security purposes but as long as it stays troll free we're good mm-hmm. all right yeah. sounds good well you guys have a good night and uh... well thank you miss gia and like i said i'll add you to um the open panel open discussion list for when we have those that you can jump on for that. And then okay. um, uh, Thursday nights, uh, usually we read scripture together. And then whoever wants to jump on and talk about the scriptures that we just read is more than welcome to as well. So we have quite a few open panels that you can jump on whenever you like. Okay. I I, just, I, I love and enjoy your, your channel. I, I, I'm I'm a frequent visitor. Oh, well, praise God. Uh, We want to make a place where fellowship can happen and it's just uh, charity prevails while doctrine is uh, sharpening. (laughs) You know, sharpen swords about doctrine. So, no, praise God. That's awesome to hear. Go ahead, Esteban. Uh, Can I ask? Oh, man, I was going to ask you a question. Uh, I wanted to see how... I wanted to see when she believed. <laughs> How long she believed? Well, yeah. I'm sure she'll be around um, again. Uh, you know, I didn't. We didn't catch how long, but she did come out of some some major heresies. So that that would be cool to hear. Maybe we'll get her on a Tuesday testimony one day soon. That would be awesome. I'd love to hear that. Right. So. Um, well, I'm going to call it a night, but does the decisionism, does that make more sense to you now? The, the, there is volition. You, you choose to find out. You choose to learn. But when you, the understanding comes, that's all God. That's not any man. And when the understanding comes, it only comes to those who would not reject it. God, if, if somebody would reject the truth 
God wouldn't reveal it to him. It it makes more sense because I mean it is him uh, doing all that, you know. Um, and and I, I hear what you're saying too about the whole. Uh, well, I mean, that's why they. It sounds so similar to what you're saying with the Calvinistic stuff. That's why it. I'm like that's why I didn't understand it for so long because I, I and then you and Gia both explained it and I was like, oh, okay, so now you have two witnesses. <laughs> So that made more and more sense when you guys both tried to explain it to me. Um, eh, so I, I get it more. Um, and yeah, uh, the evidence, if I can just say this real quick too, um, it had to have been God because I was so stuck into into that heresy of the um, uh, Hebrew roots. Nobody could have gotten me out of that because I kept arguing with everybody. Only God could have done that. So I, I hear you. Right. right. Well, and see, Calvinism, they try to say that no free will is involved at all. That's where they are wrong. They, they say that God elected, chose who's going to be saved and who isn't going to be saved. And that's not true. So there's a mixture of the both. That's why decisionism and Calvinism are the two most dangerous false gospels they are. There are. Because they are the closest to the truth without actually being there. And they're on opposite sides. So decisionism is on one side in the ditch. Calvinism is on the other side in the ditch. On the other side of the narrow road. But um, there is no volition at the moment of salvation but if you exclude volition anywhere else, it's a different gospel. But if you add volition at the moment of salvation, or to bring you right there, you know, oh, he's revealed it, now you get a choice to reject it or, or accept it. That volition is that able to choose is decisionism, and it is a work of iniquity. That can also explain why um, a lot of, like, like when you look at, um, one more thing real quick, I'm so sorry, um, with Noah, um, how there was only eight people, you know, physical life saved, but also spiritual life saved as well. But um, it's so narrow, everything, the more you read into it, it's like, he's the narrow way. And a lot of people are missing a lot of it. So, I hear you, Matthias. I do. And it's not about being a stickler. That's not the, that's not the purpose. It's that Satan is so good at his lies, sounding so much like the truth, that there's got to be... A, a, a division line so that people can understand the difference between Calvinism, the true gospel of grace, and decisionism, and everywhere else. <laughs> you know, like you've got total works, and then you've got Calvinism, and then you've got the... Uh, uh, the true gospel of grace and then you've got decisionism and then you have more works <laughs> so it's uh, they're uh they're real close sadly that's that's very scary when you think about it or it just adds to few there be that find it and this is why this is also connected to the full assurance the you know that you know that you know him because people can regurgitate the truth all day long it sounds right because it is right but if God himself has not revealed it to them if they're just regurgitating what they heard another man say God's not going to let them feel comfortable in their unsalvation so they will doubt what they believe 
because they don't really believe it. That's the point. When you truly believe something, do you doubt in any way, shape, or form, Estevan, that your icon is red and black? Do you doubt that at all? Do you think that there could be any purple in it? Like the whole thing purple? No. I mean, it shows the colors right there. And you don't you don't doubt it in any way because you believe it to be true that the colors that you've been taught as red and black are the majority of what's chosen to make up a heart for your icon. You believe that because the evidence has persuaded you of it. And do you have a morsel of doubt about that? No, I don't have a doubt about that. Because you really believe it. Yeah. Here, here's the thing. What you think is red, everyone else in the whole world could think is a different color. But because the evidence has persuaded you, you believe it without a doubt. That's because everything you believe, truly believe, whether it is true or not, you don't doubt. But when it comes to salvation... God will not let somebody in their own salvation feel comfortable. That is a gift of God, not an act from the devil. People huh, say, oh, I'm... it's the devil sending you doubt. No, it's God not letting you feel secure in your own salvation. That's beautiful. It's not some terrible thing. Um, I've, I've had moments where it's like one second I did doubt, and then out of nowhere, why am I doubting? And then, like, these verses pop up in my head. Um, and I can't explain them. I mean, it, just something I've, you know, when you read the scripture, uh, what does it say in the scripture, too, that, that the Holy Spirit brings it back to remembrance? Right, right. Well, see, that's, people try to throw in our face that, oh, these momentary things of doubt, how could, no, if somebody has momentary things of doubt and the Holy Spirit starts doing the battle and fighting the fight, the battle's in the mind, so if those momentary thoughts of doubt come in and the Holy Spirit steps up and declares your standing, that actually brings assurance that not, it's, not, it's not doubt. But when people get those momentary things of doubt and then they accept them or uh, hold them as their own, and then they start getting scared and... That's the whole living in well, fear. Yeah, when when I when that happens to me, when and out of nowhere, like I said, those verses start coming out. It brought me peace. I didn't, I didn't fear anymore. Like I would have a momentary fear, like a moment of fear, but it would be like gone in an instant because then it starts bringing back John three sixteen, John five twenty four. Um, you know all these different verses. I just start to come in and I, I mean I'm not saying that it's like uh, it's perfect or anything either because I'm not going to say I'm perfect at you know the scripture but it just starts popping in my head and it's only Christ like I can't be persuaded that it's not only him it, it is only him he is the king of kings well, king of peace kind of, and all that that's kind of what real belief is like I couldn't be persuaded that I'm that I'm a female even though there are some males out there that have made themselves believe that they were a female born in a male's body. But they don't really believe that. But they are trying to make themselves believe it. And I know that I'm a man and I could never make myself believe otherwise. The evidence has persuaded me. And don't you also say uh, make believe? It's make believe or something too. If you, uh, try to, it, it, if you try to make yourself believe anything, that's nothing more than make believe. You can't make yourself believe anything. That's uh, the atheists use that as an excuse, but then they're like saying, "Oh, that's all these Christians have this superficial. They can't make themselves believe," or, or they'll say, "I can't make myself believe." the Christian Bible, so why is that, why is it my fault that I would go to hell because I don't believe? 
well, they're using this truth to speak against God, where it's actually the opposite. <laughs> no, you can't make yourself believe that's true. But God can reveal the evidence to you to where you know for sure. And that's what the Bible calls belief. Think of it um, this way. The devils believe. But do you think they don't know who God is? Do you don't think they b trust that his word is true and that they are going to be tortured at a certain time? We have evidence of it when they said, well, we know who thou art, the Holy One of God. Have you come to torture us before the time? You know, that's recorded for us. So the devils know who he is. They trust what he said is so but salvation wasn't provided to them even though they know salvation is by grace through faith alone because devils are at the head of every denomination trying to get people stuck in works keep them away from grace through faith alone so they are actively fighting against the true gospel which means they know the true gospel and they believe it but salvation, here's the thing, was not offered to them. Jesus didn't die on the cross for them. So they believe and they tremble. And I myself, I believe the same way those devils do. I know so believe. But I am joyful in my belief. Because I know salvation was offered for all humanity, including me especially me, because I believe. So the belief that the devils have and the belief that true saints have are the same belief. The difference is a saint is joyful, a devil trembles. But the thing is, most superficial Christians, they don't believe like, they don't know, they don't have a no-so. They haven't seen a, they haven't seen God with their own spiritual eyes. They don't know him personally to where they could trust uh um that absent from the body they have no doubt that they're present with the Lord. You know, and it makes sense too because even when you're a kid, when you have all those friends, you have to build that trust with them. It's not like uh, it's not like an easy thing where you're just gonna go. Oh, well, I trust you. Right, not true trust, and that's yeah, it. that's a good point. If you have to choose to trust somebody, the act of choosing to trust them goes to show you don't truly trust them, because you had to choose to trust them. If you didn't have to choose to trust them, then you did trust them. And Paula came up with uh, the best example. Uh, when we were looking for a babysitter one time, uh, we chose to trust somebody that we knew, but the things we knew about them, we didn't really trust them, <laughs> you know? So we chose to tr trust them that night, and we called home several times, left dinner early to make sure that our choice was a good thing. You know, praise God, nothing bad happened. But we chose to trust, and we didn't. But when my mom or when Daniel's family takes our kids, we don't wonder about them at all. We don't, it, we don't even think that they could be injured. Now, of course they could. Of course they could. You know, I'm not saying that it would never happen, but we trust. We actually, and I'm saying it never crosses our mind. We don't have to sit there and stop ourselves from thinking it. It's because we didn't have to choose to trust my mom. We actually do trust her. When my kids are over there, we don't think anything of them until they call and say they're ready to come home. It's because I did, we didn't have to choose to trust her. The, you know. Um, so the difference is is that if you think... You have to choose to trust somebody. You don't really trust them. Now, don't get that wrong. 
with me saying with God gives you some truth and choosing to trust it you can do you can do that and move forward that's that's not salvation and you don't really trust it but as you make that choice to choose to trust it and move forward God will re reveal more to you to where you actually can trust it there'll come a point where God will reveal so much truth to you from his word that you'll start trusting his word more than you do your own thoughts but it's because you built that trust with him directly, one-on-one, -on -one, you and him, God alone. So um, choosing to trust is not really trust. Really trusting somebody is natural after you know them. Um, I have more questions for you, but I know, I know we've been on here for a while. Um, I don't know if you're able to do another uh, live stream, maybe tomorrow or, or something, or whenever you're able to. Right, that's what I was thinking. Um, tomorrow is Tuesday. If Daniel somehow is unable to do a testimony um, or uh, 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 Bible study, which is quite possible we might be able to do it tomorrow um otherwise wow uh otherwise it's looking like it would have to be a daytime um um, oh, I'm, I'm free. Right. No, I was thinking you were, um, cause then it could be Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, but I'm, uh, I'm actually booked Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, Sunday. So then we'd be back to next Monday. Um, but next Tuesday, Daniel will be gone. And uh, we're going to um, probably uh, premiere Paula's testimony. Uh, for people who don't know, she's already given her testimony on another channel. But we're going to premiere it on this channel for a Tuesday testimony. And when I say premiere, what that means is we'll have a chat room. Like it'll replay it. Uh, we'll set it up for a certain time and then it'll be uploaded to the channel, be playing for the first time, premiering on the channel, but while it's playing, uh, there'll be a live chat, like a live stream. So we'll do that while Daniel's out of town and then we could have a discussion after that possibly as well next Tuesday. So... Go ahead and write down whatever questions you got. Um, I uh, uh, we can do. You let me know which day would be best for you, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then we can also plan on a later evening, eight days from now. Um, yeah, uh, like I said, any, any time really this week or whenever, uh, if you're available, um, I know you said tomorrow they have a testimony tomorrow. So no, I don't uh, know if that, if they, if they don't have a testimony, we can, I, I don't know if, if he does. Okay. And, and if he doesn't, I can definitely do it tomorrow for sure. All right. Well, if it's tomorrow, it would be later because, um, if he doesn't have a testimony, he'll probably do the Bible study and then, uh, after I eat dinner, we can do. But you're two hours behind me, so it's not. It won't be that late for you. Yeah, and I guess. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Uh, depending on if you're okay with it. So uh, just let me know if you're okay with it, because. Well, I'm. I was, uh, right. It depends on how much sleep I get. I'm gonna pass out, but I've got to get up and get some work done tomorrow. So, now I should be okay with it either way. Um, sleep wise but if he has a testimony lined up and he does a bible study we won't have time 
so uh but okay if uh if we don't have time tomorrow then like i said we could hit up thursday friday saturday during the day whichever one works best for you and then we can pick up the following tuesday later in the evening Okay, that'd be awesome. Um, Thursday would be fine with me if if you can't do it uh, Tuesday. Gotcha. Definitely. All right. Well, cool. Um, well, you want to say your salutation, and then I'll close it out, and we'll call it a night. Definitely. Uh, thank you, Matthias, for having me on. Uh, good night, everybody in the chat. God bless, and uh, thank you again, Matthias. God bless. Oh, no, you're welcome. Thank you for joining. And uh, I hope it was edifying for everybody, especially those who listened all the way to the end, uh, especially if you're watching this on replay. And if you have any questions or if you ever want to join on a panel like what we have, email me. If you don't know it already, it's talkingdoctrine at gmail.com. Let me know if you want to be a part of the private fellowship if you want to be put on open panel open discussion list maybe the open bible open panel bible study uh just email me let me know i can add you to any or all of the lists and uh you can be uh, more involved with the fellowship but it was a long broadcast. We're going on four hours. It's been a while since we've done a four-hour broadcast, but we are now less than ten minutes away from four hours. But it was definitely worth it. Uh, it was wonderful. Miss Gia, when you listen to this, I'm, I bet you will. But when you uh, listen to this, I want to thank you for coming on. Thank uh, Daryl, as always. Um, who else popped out of here? Uh, Brother Luke. Brother Luke did, but no, somebody before him too. Maybe not. Maybe it was just Brother Luke, but it, it, the panel, the discussion, the chat room, um, was all active. <laughs> I do apologize, uh, for the, um, I don't know what to call it, the carnival of the chat room tonight. I pray that uh, people can disagree more charitably in the future. Um, and uh, really, like I said, this was uh, an anomaly. It doesn't happen often on this channel. And Lord willing, just by love, compassion, and forgiveness... That we're able to uh, keep it that way. Uh, this fellowship is uh, unique to YouTube. And uh, I praise God that uh, he moves so uh, so fluidly through our chat room usually. So thank you for joining everybody. I hope you guys have a wonderful night. And we should if the Lord wills. See you guys tomorrow one way or another. And um, uh, until then, I, I pray that you guys stay in the Word. Stay focused on Him. Take care. God bless. And good night, everybody. Good night, everyone.